If you like the story you can support the author on Patreon link is in the description. Chapter 26, Basis for Trust Yuriuki and Swafon had spent the whole night tracking Ataki, with the former using this as a prime time to teach her lieutenant some of her advanced tracking skills, not managing to catch up to him even as the morning came. The information Yuriuki got from Kisuk wasn't conclusive as each Zanpakut was different and even if they were of the same type, their mode of application was different. But this didn't phase Yuriuki one bit. At the end of the day, Itaki was just another soul with a troublesome Zanpakut, just like a lot of Shinigamis in the Siridei. Un, are you sure we're going in the right direction, Yuriuki sama Swafon slowly asked, understandably so since they have yet to come across anything that gave them assurance that their course was correct. Yuriuki laughed a little. Trust me, Swafon. That brat might be good but it isn't that easy to deceive me. It had taken her a bit of time to realize that the little clues they had been picking up from Itaka's trail were slowly changing their general direction. Itaka knew that they were tracing him and so he gave them a trail, one that started leading them astray after they had gotten comfortable tracking it. Let's hurry up a bit, Swafon. I'm sure we'll catch him before the day runs out. She said and pushed ahead. Though she was slightly wound up, Swafon didn't let out any complaints and increased her speed to match Yuriuki's. General POV, with Itaki. He knew the three of them wouldn't last a minute against the hollow, and not because the hollow was strong but because of its abilities. Looking at the woman who was finding it harder to breathe with every ticking second made it clear just how potent its paralytic toxins are. He was convinced there was something wrong with this hollow, but now his priorities were different. He had no bargaining rights if he blatantly opposed the Shinigamis, he was aware of that, so this was something to test the surface of the people he might have to deal with if cooperation fell through. He would have preferred to watch for longer but given how weak these Shinigamis were, he had to tell himself to act. Letting his presence known, the Hollow was the first to notice him and faltered for a brief moment at the arrival of an unaccounted variable a bad move. All it saw was blurs at different positions before a searing pain ran through his body as it felt a sword being thrust through the hollow mask on its back that failed to catch when Ataki appeared behind him. It tried to screech in pain, wriggle violently, or even attack its attacker out of reflex, only to find itself frozen just like the girl he paralyzed. Ataki stared apathetically as the hollow faded out of existence upon having its mask broken. Turning towards the two stunned Shinigamis who flinched under his eyes, he ignored the shaking swords pointing at him and walked towards the woman whose insides were on the verge of exploding as her riot ran amok inside her body. Gee get away from her. The leader shouted, yet he didn't move a step to help her. Itaka pulled out the hollow's finger from her chest and used his eyes to scan her body of pressure points to expel the rampaging riot zoo. Here, here, and here. He thought as he poked three points on her body, two on her chest and one on her left wrist, and watched as she fell to the ground with his breaths finally stabilizing. Mika. The two Shinigamis ran to their companion after Itaka moved away, breathing in relief after confirming that she wasn't dead. Especially with the way Itaka had forcefully expelled her Ryatsu. Thank you, for helping us kill that hollow and also saving our friend. I'm Arado Shijun, 8th Division's 9th seat. That's Kyujo and Mika. The leader introduced himself and his companions and Itaka nodded and returned the question. Itaki. He simply said. Forgive me for asking but which division are you from? I'm sorry, but I don't seem to remember you. Arado said awkwardly. Of course he didn't know every Shinigami in Seoul society but at least he should have a basic recollection of them, especially given how strong Ataka seemed to be. Not a Shinigami. Was all Ataka said as he took a seat on a rock and closed his eyes. Arado and the chubby Kyujo were genuinely surprised at Ataka's admission of not being a Shinigami but they kept quiet about it. It doesn't take a genius to know that Itaki was stronger than them and if he truly wasn't a Shinigami, he could kill them if he wanted and no one would ever know it was him. They could only awkwardly stand there as Itaki paid them no mind with his mind closed. Arado was about to send a message back to his lieutenant when Itaki finally spoke up, but not at them it seemed. Since you're already here, why bother hiding? What happened here? Arado yelped in surprise as he saw Yuriuki and Swafon suddenly appearing a foot from where Mika was laying down. Captain Yuriuki. After the brief shock, Arado and Kyujo stood ramrod at attention in salute to Yuriuki who ignored the greeting. What happened here? She asked again and this time stared at Arado who quickly explained what had transpired. I see. Was her only reply to the nervously sweating Arado's explanation. She turned to Ataka who still had his eyes closed and regarded him with a raised brow. And here I thought you would have disappeared by now. 
as long as you let me be. Itaka succinctly replied, and continued before Yuriuaki or Swa Fon could get an answer in. Follow me. Seeing Itaka leaving, Swa Fon and the other Shinigamis turned to Yuriuaki to see her decision and only when she nodded did they made to move. Don't worry. Stay here with her, I'll go see what he's up to. Yuriuaki said to Arato before leaving with Swa Fon. Following Itaka's lead, the two ladies wore unsure expressions as he led them through the tight spaces that led underground. What the hell is this place? Yuriuaki asked, all traces of playful casualness gone from her face. She saw the five dead bodies of Shinigamis in the underground cave and even the tattered remains of Shinigami Shiakush scattered around the cave. It isn't that hard to hazard a guess. And why show me this? Yuriuaki turned to Itaki, cold eyes peering into colder eyes. What do you want? Nothing substantial. Just for you Shinigamis to leave me alone. What he meant was for them to move past the fact that he did kill some Shinigamis and Yuriuaki understood which was why her eyes squinted at him. No problem, but know this. If you come to the Siridei, you'll have to be extensively interrogated for your possession of a Zanpakut. Central 46 can be a bunch of annoying bugs if they want to be. She said. You might even have your Zanpakut sealed for some time if they are feeling real petty. To attack his credit, he didn't react at all to Yuriuaki's words. As much as he abhorred it, he knew politics were an integral part of any functioning society. His only thoughts were if the politics of the Siridei were something he could stomach for long. I'll be waiting for you up ahead. They watched as Itaka left, both taking a minute to take in the state of the bodies in the cave. Do you think we can trust him, Yuriuaki sama Swa Fon asked as they made their way to the surface. Yuriuaki snorted. Of course not. Better this way as we can keep a watchful eye on him. If he ends up trustworthy then good for us. And if he doesn't. Then it'll be easier to deal with him. Yuriuaki answered. They saw Itaka sitting on the same rock he had been sitting on when they arrived. Yuriuaki then gave her orders to Swa Fon and the others. Swa Fon, you stay here and wait for those from the second. As for you, go back and report to your captain. Itaki opened his eyes as he felt they were alone, with Swa Fon below and the others gone, finally regarding Yuriuaki. He saw her giving him an appraising stare but just closed his eyes back. Seeing Itaka's actions, Yuriuaki gave him a serious warning. If this is some harebrained plan of yours, then I'll suggest you give it up. I won't forgive you if you break the trust of my goodwill. Hearing her words, Itaka stood up and started walking away, slowly speaking as he did. Trust means nothing if the basis for it is shallow. We'll see. Yuriuaki replied, disappearing as she did, and so did Itaki a moment later. Chapter 27, Arriving in the Siridei The two of them drew ever so close to the Siridei and throughout their whole journey, Itaka kept thinking if the choice he made was a good one. Unlike the elemental nations where he had basic knowledge of the state of the military force of each of the hidden villages, he felt truly blind here in the Soul Society so he needed an in. Yes, he long entertained the idea of infiltrating the Soul Society but he had to leave that as a last resort slash desperate move after his two run-ins with the Shinigami captains. He was confident in himself no doubt, but having to face thirteen captains who would be roughly on the same level as him were not odds he saw himself winning. As for having his manjiki, while it might make his chances of a successful infiltration higher, the result would still be the same if he was to be found out. During their journey, he asked Yuriuki a few questions, not pressing ones but still important, and she made sure to give him the barest minimum of any answer she could afford. They knew the type of person the other was and giving Itaka straight answers was the same as giving him an extensive report. Yuriuaki knew that. Assassination or military? Yuriuaki suddenly asked. I'm asking which were you? She expounded. You don't strike me as the rogue type, definitely not a mercenary, so which were you? Itaka looked at her as they traveled side by side, rogue. Yuriuaki chuckled. She could sense a story there but she didn't ask. There'll be more than enough time to air his pants once he gets settled in. To her, this whole thing was a mishmash of irony and amusement, kinda like picking up a stray cat, Itaki, and bringing it to a new home. We'll be going straight to the head commander once we get there follow me and say nothing. She ordered but then paused and looked at Itaka whose face bore an impassiveness as if he didn't hear her. Or I guess just be you, that also works. She directed a subtle glance at Itaki, hiding the amazement that she was feeling. Throughout their journey, the two of them were playing a subtle game to gauge as much information as they could from the other. 
The only caveat to this little game was for the other party to know what type of test they were being put through and the nature of the ongoing test to facilitate the degree of the response they were to give. On Ataka's part, he had tested her on her senses to the environment and Ryatsu, the range, her reaction, and even first instinct. And this brat is still testing me. Yoruyuki mused, half annoyed and half gratified. Of course she wouldn't just let him have his way and not respond in kind. The same way and facets he tested her on was the same thing she tested him on in her own way. Also his emotional spectrum and first thought response, along with his speed which was what made her very surprised. He's not just capable of short burst speed but can also maintain it for long distances with a balanced pace. Just short of his kid mastery and Bankai and he'll be captain level easily. Monster. She didn't let her thoughts show and just led him along, drawing ever closer to the Siraeman, gates of the Siraidei. Mind telling me what your life was like? Just small talk, nothing serious. Yoruyuki tried again, this time genuine in his request. Itaka looked over at the purple-haired captain, briefly wondering when last he was ever in such a situation where a stranger would be this frivolous with him even after hearing his name. Well she isn't trying to run away or kill me on sight, so that too is a first. The former rogue ninja thought. For once, he needed to think in a way that was free from his past influence as he thought of an answer to his question. He didn't have to answer, he was brought up and trained that way, but that wasn't the case. The question he was plagued with was if he should answer in the first place. Damn brat, you've got a lot of garbage. It's gonna be annoying as hell to pull that out of your ass. Don't worry, take your time. Offered your Yuki with an out. This wasn't the first time she's seen someone like this in her long life. It was a normal trait of people brought up and fermented in hard times and tragedies. Or war. We are almost at the northern gates, let's hurry up. She said all of a sudden and disappeared out of Ataka's range. Truly, she's fast. He lightly commented and disappeared in an increasing burst of speed, quickly catching up to Yoruyuki who had a knowing smirk on her face. From afar, Itaka saw the pure white walls and heavy gates, along with the faint thrumming of some type of riot so that covered the gate's surface. There was a giant gatekeeper there but he had no idea when they passed through the gates. Immediately as he entered the Siridei, Itaka felt the soft charging of the energy in the air. No doubt, this place had a lot of strong people. He cast a cursory glance over the Siridei, quickly noting the demarcations that divided the Siridei into rings. That's where we're going. The head commander's first division of the Godei 13. Yoruyuki pointed her fingers at the innermost part of the Siridei and for where they stood, Itaka could make out the tall building in the distance with what seemed to be a written kanji on its walls. They jumped onto the roof of the surrounding buildings, making large strides and drawing closer to the office of the 1st Division's headquarters. Slowing down to a stop, Yoruyuki led Itaka through the long hall, leading the both of them directly to head commanders and the founder of the Godei 13 office. Come in. An old gruff voice sounded out from behind the tall door followed by a banging sound. The doors opened on their own and the two of them stepped in. On the far end of the room, sitting on a chair while holding forward a wooden cane, was the venerated leader of the Shinigami, Genri Yusai Shigakuni Yamamoto, captain of the Godei 13, 1st Division. Before Yamamoto stood eleven individuals standing on opposite sides with a calm air around them, relaxed stature born out of a confidence of power. Judging from the white Hayori they all wore, Itaka didn't have to be a genius to note that at this moment, gathered before him, was the thirteen captains, figureheads of the Shinigami. Oh, would you look at that? That's a face I wasn't expecting to see in this meeting. All eyes in the room trailed to the source of the laid-back voice of Ishin Shiba who looked genuinely surprised on seeing Itaki. Oh? Seems you know the fella, Ishin. Mind cluing the rest of us in. A long blonde-haired man, Hiroko Shinji captain of the 5th division, spoke out. Before any of them could come up with another answer or question, Yamamoto once again banged his cane on the ground and brought the room back to silence. Captain Shion, who is that with you and tell us why you have called for this meeting? He spoke. Itaki, since the beginning, was taking note of everyone in the room. From those on the left side, the long curly blonde captain of the 3rd Division, Roger Torabashi, the black-haired woman with a neutral face, captain of 4th Division, Retsu Anohana. Following Anohana was Hiroko Shinji and following him was Ishin Shiba, and besides him was a pale white-haired man, Jushir Yukatake, captain of the 13th Division. On the right-hand side was an old man with a white scarf around his neck, oozing composure and nobility, Jinrei Kukaki, captain of the 6th Division. 
Besides him was a man sporting an afro and wearing sunglasses, Love Akawa, captain of the 7th Division. Following Love was a man wearing a straw hat with a sakura printed kimono over his Hayori, Shunsui Kiraku, captain of the 8th Division. After Shunsui was Kensei Magurama, captain of the 9th Division, a short haired and stout looking man with a rigid expression on his face, and following him was a man with braided spiked hair with bells at each end. Sporting a feral grin, an eye patch on his right eye, and a long scar over his left eye, was Zaraki Kenpeki, captain of the 11th Division. And Ataki immediately saw a splitting image of Kisame in him. The last person was a shaggy blonde man standing hunched back with most tired expression in the room, Kisokura Hara, captain of the 12th Division. Chapter 28, Ataki's Trial I The feral, unabated bloodthirsty air surrounding the 11th Division captain was something that spurred a mental image of Ataki's former companion during his Akatsuki days, Kisame Hashigaki. Maybe with a little bit of Haydn too, without his religious fanaticism. Even with all of them having their Ryatsu under perfect control, apart from Zaraki Kenpeka who was having his barely restrained Ryatsu billowing over him, it was easy to tell that each and every single individual here were strong, though a few specific people caught Ataka's attention more than the others. Ah uh, yes, that's why we're here. Yoruyuki began, standing in the middle of the two last captains, facing Yamamoto. This is Ataki Uchiha from North Rukonga 69th District, a recently reincarnated soul barely having spent over a year in the Soul Society. Mind getting on with it. I wasn't dragged here for a report, was I? An irritated Kenpeki interrupted Yoruyuki with a frown on his face. Yoruyuki paused, gave him a look, and then turned back to Yamamoto. He's the one Captain Shiba encountered during his last mission scouting in the Rukonga. That's him. Hirato Shinji asked, scratching his head confusedly. I heard he killed some of Captain Shiba's squad members. If this is a trial, why not just toss him to Central 46? Yamamoto had his calm eyes trained on both Yoruyuki and Ataki, more the latter than the former. Captain Shion, tell us why you brought him here with you. Shunsui Kiriko tilted his straw hat downwards so that it covered his eyes, muttering in realization to himself. Well, here we go. Easy. I brought him here so that the charges against him will be dropped and I plan to bring him into my division. A pin drop silence enveloped the hall as some of the captains were stunned speechless, some held their head down, shaking it in Yoruyuki's daring request, while one just grinned. Captain Shion, Yamamoto started, the air of the room suddenly turned stifling. Did you just request that the Siridi I wave off the charges against Ryoka for killing fellow Shinigami in order for you to let him into your division? He asked slowly. Despite the pressure that was coming off Yamamoto, Yoruyuki stood her ground unfazed, so also did Itaki, something which caught all the captain's attention. Yes, that's basically what I want. In his defense, he was unaware of the situation given how recent he arrived in the Soul Society. Captain Shiba can confirm this. Yoruyuki's response resulted in a surprised at, from Ishin who didn't expect him to be called in defense of Itaki. Captain Shiba, is that true? Yamamoto turned to Ishin who was cursing Yoruyuki's carefreeness in his head. Seeing all the attention once more focused on him, Ishin looked at Itaki and Yoruyuki, somehow taken aback by how calm Itaki was. Something he knew wasn't a mask but was instead the boy's mental state. Cursing himself along Yoruyuki, he nodded. I can affirm that what Captain Shion said is true. He answered in support of Itaki. When we first met, he did introduce himself and give a brief summary of his situation but the fight broke out after he refused to sheath his weapon and come with us. Honestly, Itaki was surprised that Ishin would speak in his favor given how he had killed a few of his subordinates. His initial thoughts on the man were not enough to draw a conclusion of his character that Itaki could trust. Not only that, but he's been hunting hollows and bandits during his days in the Soul Society from the reports I had my own people dig up. Not to mention with the latest information I'm sure Captain Kiriko received he also saved three members of his squad from a hollow attack that would have killed them, I verified that myself. Yoruyuki shared the information she had on Itaki with the other captains, especially the hiding ground where the dead bodies of five Shinigamis were found. She dug up most of my actions from the 69th district till recent. Itaki thought, surprised that she was able to find out that much given the few people he's had contact with for a year. Even when he entered any settlement or village, the number of contact he had with the people there never exceeded two. That's quite the report, Captain Shion. Yamamoto commented after listening to all that Yoruyuki had in defense of Itaki. 
It wasn't just Yamamoto that was surprised at Yuriyuki's change in character from being laid back as she normally was. That's my job, head captain. And I'm good at my job. She smirked. Yamamoto sighed. As true as those words are, there are still a few things left to confirm. You, Itaki Uchiha, mind explaining how you came in possession of a Zan Pakut, and not just that, but also unlocked its Shikai state. Apart from Ishin who had suspected it and Kisuk who was aware of it, Yuriyuki had made no mention of Itaki's combat abilities yet so none of the captains thought he had unlocked a Shikai. Regardless of when he unlocked it, the fact that he achieved his Shikai in months of him arriving in the Soul Society made it clear how talented he was. Yuriyuki looked wryly at Yamamoto and ended up shrugging. I've done my best, brat. Try not to mess up my hard work, okay? She said to Itaki as she left to stand on the right-hand side besides Kisuk. I picked it up from the body of a dead Shinigami after a hollow incident I came across in the 67th district. Following that, I observed the Shinigamis I came across as I made my way down the Rukonga and that clued me in on the fact that the sword was more than just a mundane weapon. Also with the fact that it seems to passively meld itself with my energy. I only achieved the Shikai after my fight with Captain Shiba after understanding what it was. He told them what he knew and what he did during his time in the Rukonga districts. Since these captains weren't outright overbearing, he figured it'd be against his better interests if he wasn't honest. Not like there was anything of value in his daily life. The only thing he kept to himself was his Shikai abilities and his eyes, silently thankful that Yuriyuki didn't bring it up. Oi, you said you fought a captain, killed his subordinates and still managed to escape while not having that Shikai thing. Ken Peiki asked with a happy grin on his face. Hey, old man. Let me fight him. If he dies then he isn't worth our attention, if he doesn't. Well, we'll continue fighting until one of us drops. That's better than this boring talk, right? A soft snort interrupted Ken Peika's impassioned plea. Why not let the head captain give his decisions before you try to satisfy your vain desire? Jinrei Kukaki calmly chided the brute, Ken Peiki. Hey? What are you on, damn twig? Keep being silent or I'll come over and help you do that, permanently, this time. Ken Peka snarled at the elegantly looking old man who didn't bother to deign him a response. Now wasn't that another surprise? Escaping a captain using his Shikai while not having one. From what my Zan Pakutes spirit told me, this sword is its permanent home so I'm sorry, but if your words revolve around me handing it over, I won't. Itaka said, looking at Yamamoto. He knew that if it were to come to a fight, it was virtually impossible for him to escape the encirclement especially when he didn't have his main Jikias Amaterasu and Susanoo, but that didn't mean he would let them just take away a part of his soul without fighting for it. Yuriyuki palmed her head while Kisuk snickered beside her as all the captains were now staring at Itaka with a cold expression at his words that could be construed as a direct challenge. It will do you good to not be so confrontational with your words, young man. It can get scary real fast for you. Just a friendly advice. Shunsui said while tilting his hat a little higher to cross his eyes with Itaka's. Itaka received his look, held it for a second before turning back to Yamamoto to know what the man had to say. It needed no saying that the person Itaka felt the most powerful momentum from was the old man sitting down. It honestly reminded him of the Leaf's Lord III. The youthful brashness children display is something I'll never get over. Yamamoto said, and it could have just been Itaka's perception, but he could see flickers of flame trickling at the man's feet. That aside, there are a lot of complications involved with your acceptance into the Godi I-13. And the only reason why this is being considered is because of a reputable captain deciding to stand in defense of you. As such, you'll have to answer a few of my questions. Chapter 29, Itaka's Trial 2 The weight of the atmosphere inside this large room thickened exponentially that all the frivolity present in some of the captain's faces were wiped away, but yet Itaka didn't buckle under it or look as if it was affecting him still having that calm neutrality on his face, never shifting. Did you come here of your own will or did Captain Shine capture you and bring you here? Facing Yamamoto's first question, Itaka didn't hesitate to answer. It also helped that he was dealing with a straightforward person. My plan since waking up has always been to come to here and upon meeting Captain Yuriyuki who offered a much more easier way than infiltrating it, I decided to follow her. Itaka's answer threw some of the captains into a loop. Some of them wondered why Itaka would say something like that and possibly heap suspicion onto him, not just from the head captain but all of them as well. On the other hand, Itaka knew that unlike the panel of captains here, the person he had to convince was the head captain and only the head captain. 
not the captains and not the central 46 governing body they had made a few mention of. Even if he was on the back foot power-wise, Itaka has never once doubted his senses and instincts. He was sure he had a comfortable read on Yamamoto's character. He has the momentum of Lord Third, but he's more like him. Danzo Shimura. With this template established, all he had to do was find the line and know when to tow it and when to keep away from it. Just because he preferred small and straightforward talks didn't mean he couldn't lie or wasn't cunning enough. He had those in spades and more. Hmm. I see. And now that you're here, pray tell, what are you going to do now? Learn about the hollows and the Shinigamis. I never expected the afterlife to be like this. All I want is to be sufficiently knowledgeable of this new world around me. He told everyone. Unlike the simple decisions that these were, for Itaka he had to spend a lot of time to come to these as his choices of action. He had to constantly remind himself that he wasn't on an undercover mission and he didn't have to come up with made-up scenarios and filter his way into this foreign group and get their weakness. He would do that as it was part of the information he wanted but that was just par the course as it is something that he would naturally gain knowledge of once he starts learning about Shinigami and their abilities. The difference was the way he went about it. Forgive me for saying this, head captain, but this guy smells like a folded bag of tricks. I'm sorry, Captain Shion, but that's just my gut speaking. Shinji said, wryly smiling as he apologized to Yuriyuki. But honestly, when did the princess ever get this active? For someone else for that matter? Let me say this, head captain, but remember that all this came from a misinterpretation between him and Captain Shiba. If that's not enough, we can verify the time frame he unlocked his Shikai. As for his strength and mental fortitude, it was due to his life as a warrior, that I can personally verify. None of his abilities and fighting styles were culled from the ones we Shinigamis use. Yuriyuki said, crossing her hands while feeling a bit annoyed. She was finally starting to wonder if this was a bad idea from the start but unfortunately she couldn't change it and could only go on with it and see the end of it. She gave her word so she'll do her best concerning Itaka becoming a member of her division. Leaving things halfway was not her style. Rest assured, I've heard all that you've said, Captain Shion, Captain Hiroko. He looked at his question, the two of them in particular, Yuriyuki frowning lightly while Shinji just shrugged nonchalantly. Captain Anohana, Captain Kukaki, what are your thoughts? He asked those two specifically while lightly resting backwards on his chair. Itaka looked at the two captains Yamamoto called out, the black-haired woman and the permed white-haired old man with the silk scarf around his neck mentally taking note of what could be an informal counsel to Yamamoto. Anohana bowed slightly to Yamamoto and looked directly at Itaka for the first time. I believe the reports of Captain Shion have substantial weight, more so when in conjunction with Captain Shiba and Captain Urahara confirming most of the technicalities. Since he'll be under Captain Shion's watch, I see no need for heavy stipulations to be placed on him. Hmm, Captain Kukaki. Yamamoto nodded and turned to the 6th Division Captain. It shouldn't be forgotten that he did break a few of the Siridei's rules and that should come with its equal punishment, even if it was done in ignorance. A precedent should not be encouraged or more would come from it. I also see no reason to stop Captain Shion from taking him into her division, he'll have to be tested but that is all up to her. Jinrei Kukaki finished his words, giving his opinion from an unbiased standpoint. They couldn't just brush off anyone who kills Shinigami and claim it to be ignorance or a misunderstanding. That would just set a chaotic trend that would be too hard to deal with then. Yamamoto lightly tapped his cane against the ground and the room returned to still silence once again with all the captains keeping their thoughts to themselves until Yamamoto's decision. After a short while, Itaka saw Yamamoto open his eyes and look at Ishin and inquired of him. Captain Shiba, do you have any words against this young man? Ishin shook his head at Yamamoto and the old man nodded. I see. In that case... I will accept him as a Shinigami in training under Captain Shion and the umbrella of the 2nd Division and have him sent to Shin Academy. Um, I don't think that's necessary. He's already stronger than any instructor that'll be teaching them over at the Academy, hell even most of our lieutenants. Yuriyuki cut in, abashedly dodging a soft glare from a mildly crossed head captain who was irritated at being cut off. In any other situation, that would be your call to make but since he's mostly an unknown to everyone except you and Captain Shiba. I think it's better for the captains to judge that since you just claimed him stronger than their lieutenants. Yamamoto waved off Yoriyuki's words since at this point he had nothing to do with it and this case would just be disturbing his tranquility if it stretches even more from here on out. Yes, I'm fighting him so all of you step back. Ken Peke warned with a malicious smile on his face as he stared down Itaki. 
Meanwhile Itaki remained mostly quiet as he tried painting a dynamic of the captains with his observations so far. Looking at Kenpeki, Itaki could already smell the wildly surging bloodlust and just when it threatened to burst out, Yamamoto raised his hand and that gesture arrested Kenpeki's rising bloodlust, earning the head captain a furious glare from the angry captain of the 11th. Rather, have him fight a lieutenant or one of your stronger seated officers. You have no objection, do you? Itaki shook his head. I don't. Thank you for hearing me out. He said to Yamamoto who snorted at his words. Carry your further talks to the training ground. Yamamoto said as he stood up, hunched back, and started walking out of the room followed by the twelve dismissed captains. So tell me, Itaki boy, what's your thoughts so far? Shunsui asked as he walked beside Itaki who was flanked by Yuriuaki and aboard out of his mind Kisuk. My thoughts on what? Itaki asked back. Anything, everything. Even the air itself. What do you think? Shunsui said with a laugh and wanted to tell Itaki that he was just playing around only to find Itaki, still with his neutral look, but with a certain look in his eyes. I like the moon. It is never changing. Itaki said as they stepped inside the training grounds of the first division. Shunsui adjusted his hat with a dropped smile. I see. I like wine, it is intoxicating. Consider dropping by for some wine under the moonlight, that's one of my favorite pastimes. Shunsui left them and moved over to where the weak-looking Jashiro was standing. Yoruaki looked around, seeing no lieutenant present, and couldn't help but ask. Whose lieutenant are we using for this little show? How about we call Lisa, Ekiraku? I love that suggestion, Yoruaki. Let me send for her, haha, she's going to love this. Shunsui laughed and ordered one of the Shinigamis to bring his overworked lieutenant to fight Itaka who was content with just watching everyone and the little actions they made with every movement. Chapter 30, A Show and Tell Am I being too hasty? This was the thought that plagued Itaka's mind as he stood in the training ground surrounded by the spectating captains. It was a thought that occurred very much to him hence why he was having a hard time figuring it out. As an individual, especially someone of his capabilities, Itaka has always been resolute in his decisions and dealing, same with the consequences that come with those decisions. He never let out a word of opposition even when they said to observe his skills against one of their own as this was something he knew they would do. After all, the hidden villages did the same thing. No cage would accept a foreign jonin into their ranks without a thorough scrutiny of their abilities. It was a very strict process for long-term undercover ninjas with those kinds of missions, unlike how calm and laid-back these captains were. With how diverse their abilities are, I guess it makes sense when every single Shinigami has the potential to have unique abilities. He watched as a female Shinigami walked into the training grounds after greeting the captains and stood across from him. The lieutenant, Lisa Yadomaru, as Itaka heard them call her, was a bespectacled woman with turquoise eyes and a long braided ponytail swinging behind her. Don't look so confused, Lisa Chan. We want you to fight this man, Itaki, here. Her captain said smilingly. Oh, and you don't need to hold back at all. Call it our genuine curiosity, if you will. You don't mind that, do you, Itaki? Itaki shook his head. No need to be worried about it as this was something foreign slash rogue ninjas go through when joining any formal military group. Well then. You guys can start any time you want. As Shunsui said that, he and the other captains moved further backwards to give the two combatants enough space. Facing Itaki who was a stranger, the female Shinigami introduced herself. I'm Lisa Yadomaru, lieutenant of the 8th division. Itaki Uchiha. He returned the gesture and drew out his sword. They stood, sizing each other up, one curious while the other contemplating. Seeing how she was still trying to get a read on him, Itaka took her consideration with appreciation and attacked first. Her eyes widened and she reacted with a block as she suddenly saw Itaki attacking her with a speed that honestly left her surprised. Before she could back out to regain her balance, she felt his hand on her shoulders and next thing she knew was that she was being thrown to the ground. With her decades of experience, along with the capability that came with being Shunsui's Kirikou's lieutenant, she grabbed onto Itaka's hand holding her shoulders and used it as a leverage to twist herself into balance midair and kicked his chest to push herself away. He's strong. For experienced fighters, if a glance wasn't enough to gleam the strength class of an opponent, then the initial clash would. Now she understood why her captain said not to hold back, but to her defense, half the things that came from his mouth were not to be taken seriously. She steadied her breath and held her sword to Itaki. She nodded at him and that began the next salvo of attacks. 
Itaka faced her as she pointed her palms at him, something he had seen Yuriyuki do, and like he was mindful of, the familiar attack came. Had number 31, Shaka. He dodged the red blast that shot at him and crossed the small distance between them and slashed a feint with his sword only to kick her in the sides which was hastily blocked. Lisa grunted under the force of the kick only to look perplexed as smoke started coming from Itaka's mouth. Her senses warned her but before she could jump back, Itaka swung his sword to her left side, promptly reducing her retreat path to one. She saw Itaka grind his teeth and produced a spark from it that ignited the ash and exploded it on them. The two of them detached from each other but it was clear that she was the only one who suffered from that close-ranged attack. It was clear to the captains that none of the two were going all out, simply feeling the depths of their opponents, except that one was on the back leg. Just as the captains were observing Itaki, Itaki was using Lisa as a prodding lab test to gleam further into how the Shinigami fought. So far, apart from their movement technique, the head technique they used was awfully similar to ninjutsus. Watching her as one of her hands weaved a few hand signs, Itaka heard her invoke a new attack. Bakudo number 60, Rightening Gashiku Sukji. Itaka quickly looked up and above him was a charging lightning ball that immediately shot down six lightning streams, effectively binding him within a lightning cage. Unfortunately, this was a show and tell and Itaka knew he had to show his abilities to reduce their suspicion of him. Lisa had been in the middle of chanting a reduced head chant when Itaka within the lightning cage disappeared in a puff of smoke and left behind a log of wood. A slight creak of her neck showed the reflective surface of a sword held over her shoulders. Is this enough? Itaki asked, not just to her but also the captains watching. They all held intrigued smiles but none of them said anything to stop the fight. Though none of them said anything, it was pretty obvious that they wanted to see the eclipse between Itaki and Lisa, strength-wise. He was leading her on and they all knew it, reacting to her attacks instead of pressing her on with his, and that made him sigh as he lifted his sword from her shoulders. Lisa put a distance between them, an utmost serious look cast on her face, slamming her sword into its sheath and holding it over her head. She slowly pulled it out, intoning as she did so. Subas, smash, Haguro Tanbo. Her riotso burst out in a turbulent wave and her sword underwent a transformation. From the normal sleek katana she once held, now held with both hands was a long polyrm with a monk's spade blade on one end and a ball on the other. Instead of treating this as a spar of equals, Lisa looked at the fight between them as a no-holds-barred duel after truly understanding why her captain said to fight with all she had. Anything short of that would ensure her loss. Whether he needed to or not, Itaki responded in kind by holding his sword in a slanting angle and activating his shikai. Terrace, Tsukuyomi, Illuminate, Tsukuyomi. Honestly speaking, Itaka's shikai wasn't all that impressive if one had a subliminal control over their riotsu, but that didn't mean it was useless in most cases. Unlike with Lisa's Shikai release, Itaka's blade didn't have any visible changes on it which confused the spectating captains and his opponent. If not for the burst in his Ryatsu, they would have thought he just said those words, well all of them except for Yuriyuki who had an inkling on what Itaka did. It was all a leading play. Lisa pushed on her attack and thrust her polyer at Itaka who narrowly dodged it. Upon seeing the slight opening, she twisted her left arm and the polyerm wobbled and changed direction towards Itaka who faltered behind. The polyerm speared towards Itaka's legs and Itaka used his sword to stab the ground, effectively blocking the polyerm, all his actions being seen through by Lisa's calculating gaze. Slightly drawing her polyerm back, she twisted it and sent it ball end towards Itaka who was still kneeling from the force of her thrust but as soon as the pole arms end reached near him, Lisa's cold gaze faltered as another Itaka jumped over the kneeling one's shoulder and parried the polyerm with his sword, leaving her open for the one still kneeling while no longer kneeling as he drove a knee into her exposed abdomen that sent her flying backwards like a shooting star only for her to crash into something and feel someone holding her in a chokehold. A third attacky. She trembled as she saw the two attackers in front of her weave some hand signs and bring their hands towards their mouth which only opened to spout out two huge balls of fire that joined together into one and blazed towards her. Lisa Chen. What are you doing? She jumped back in shock and frantically looked around her not seeing the giant fireball or the person holding her, or even a second attacky. Why are you just standing there Lisa Chan? She turned towards her slightly frowning captain. What I thought. She looked over at Itaka who was still in the same spot her stood after activating his shikai. Did he activate his shikai? She thought, thoroughly confused. Chapter 31, Itaka's Reasons Why are you just standing there Lisa Chan? You're making me look bad. Shunsui teased even as he was inwardly confused as to what happened. 
he turned to the other captains but Yuriuki beat them to it before they could sound their confusion. It's his Shikai. It's an illusion type Zan Pakut, a quite tricky one at that. She said. She and Kisuke, being the only two that knew of his Shikai beforehand, were intently watching Ataka to see how his Shikai works. She turned to her friend who was stroking his chin as he looked at Lisa who looked terribly confused. It's selective. His illusion. What do you mean? She asked. He means that it's not just her mind that's seeing things, he can also make it a visible mirage. Anohana commented knowingly, it's also why some of you didn't notice the change in his sword. It's a very small and imperceptible illusion, but it's effective since it affected us. Some of us at least. Captain Anohana is right. He concealed the change in his Zanpakut from everyone, his initial illusion, yet Lieutenant Lisa is possibly under an entirely different one judging from how worked up she is. Kisuk explained for his fellow captains to understand. I'm afraid her loss is guaranteed. She might have had a chance, but that dropped to single percentages when he activated his Shikai. Using illusions? What kind of weak shit is that? And here I thought he'd put up a spectacular fight since two captains were vouching for his strength. Pathetic. Ken Pekka snorted as he lost a lot of interest in Ataki after that little expose. Down below, sweat trickled down Lisa's head as she struggled to get a hold on herself and the switch between real and fake. Nijichich Tonbokyuderi. She shouted and started thrusting and slashing her polyrm in fast strikes that it caused her hands and weapon to turn into a blur. Faced with her haphazard and controlled attack, Itaka figured he might as well use this chance to test out some of his Shikai's abilities. He slashed the place in front of his legs twice and let his Ryatsu flow freely through Tsukuyomi, Hakanaiya's, ephemeral reflection. To those watching, it looked as if nothing Itaka was doing had anything effect, once at least visible, but to Lisa it was all clear. Her attacks that she saw hitting Ataka started hitting what felt like mirror reflections of the man, fading away with every attack she landed. Pissed off at how confusingly hard it was to get a serious hit on her opponent, she intoned a shortened kid chant, head number 32, Kazan Dot. A bright yellow flash of light covered everything in front of her, even taking Ataka by surprise who was a little too late to quickly react. He held his sword against him as the beam swept past him, pushing him violently to the side while he used his sword to mitigate most of the damage. He had barely pushed himself out of the beam's path when he saw Lisa's polyrm's bladed edge extending towards him. He did not have much choice and met the polyrm with his sword which pushed him sliding back with a silent grunt due to the weighted force behind it. The more I put her under illusions the more adapted her reaction becomes, even if she doesn't break out of it. Itaka thought. Unlike a few powerful genjutsus, normal genjutsus were easy to break out from. Given. He wasn't using his Sharingan in tandem with Tsukuyomi as he wanted to see how Tsukuyomi's Genjutsu holds up against the vice captain before him. Better to cast the illusion on myself. A focused Genjutsu on her will force her instincts and Ryatsu to adapt and react in any way, even if not completely. He quickly understood that though his illusions worked well on the woman before him, it wasn't infallible and its strength was boosted if he used his Sharingan with it. Well, this has been quite knowledgeable for me. They clashed again. Sword and Polyrm in constant connection with each other, but unlike Lisa who was struggling to gain a clear advantage, Itaka was looking at the effects and reaction his abilities had on her. As they clashed, he once again used his ephemeral reflection but on himself this time instead of her. The effect it had this time was different as even Itaka felt as if his movements were a haze. To Lisa, numerous copies of Itaka overlapped with each other, making it even harder for her to know where to strike and where to expect an attack from as multiple hands attacked at once. She thrust her polyrm with one hand and used another to create a barrier and another one in alarm as she felt her polyrm get parried while at the same time Itaka's sword impacted her barrier. What? How? She said in surprise, and not only her, even Itaki and the captains were surprised as they too felt and saw his blade strike two places with an impacted feedback. Head number one, show. The barrier she created vibrated and reverberated a strong repulsive force that smashed into the collection of Itakai's intending to force him back but that wasn't happening as the overlapping attack eyes burst into smoke and black feathers, resulting in a recently familiar situation. Itaka stood behind her with a shortened sword to her throat. Lisa closed her eyes despondently and deactivated her shikai. I give up. She said, not really having much of a choice as she wasn't even sure how many times she landed a hit on him. Three, no, five times. I think. Itaki removed his blade that quickly lengthened as his shikai deactivated as he slid it back into its sheath. The fight was interesting to say the least and not just to him, 
but also the spectators watching. Well, Captain Shiba and Captain Yuriyuki weren't kidding. He's strong. Not exactly a power type Zan Pakut but it seems to fit him somehow. Jushiro Yukatake commented loudly, earning nods from some of the captains. He and the others turned to Yamamoto who just stood off to the side watching the whole fight in silence. He made a deep rumbling hum as he turned around, walking back to his office. Captain Shion, his duties are under your discretion. Humph. You still owe me a fight brat. Don't forget that. Ken Peka declared before leaving the remaining captains there and going back to his division's barrack. One by one the captains left, leaving only Yuriyuki, Kisuk, and Shunsui alone with Itaki and Lisa. Don't feel down, Lisa-chan, you did well. As well as you could anyway. The kimono-wearing captain laughed at the glare the upset lieutenant sent him. I'll be going now. She gave a lazy salute and disappeared from the training grounds, causing Shunsui to follow after her with a stream of laughing apologies. Hello there, young man. I'm Kiso Kirahara, captain of the 12th Division. Yuriyuki told me you have some questions you might need answers for, so you can visit me when you have time as I'd like to have some talks with you. See you later, and I'll drop by the second later tonight, Yuriyuki. Kisuk lazily waved at them and wobbled as he walked out, looking like he might tumble with every step he took. It turns out his sleepy look wasn't just a look after all. Well, come on. I'll show you to the second division's barrack, where you'll be staying until further notice. She said and led him out as they slowly walked down the streets of the Godi I-13. So how is it? Still feeling lost yet? Lost. Itaka looked at her confusedly which brought her to a chuckling fit. Even though I look like this, I'm over a century old and that look on your face is something I've seen on a few faces. My guess is war, am I right? She said with an expressionless smile. His expressions were always a leading edge he wore to observe people's reactions but to Yuriyuki, it was more than that. To her, that was the scope of emotions he could show on his face. Itaka said nothing, half remembering how easy it was for century-old souls to walk around the soul society and half pondering where Yuriyuki was going with this. For once I'm not trying to get an advantage over you. I'll be the first person to tell you that this place isn't home, can hardly ever be, even after spending centuries in it. But face it. It's a pit stop for those without purpose but drive, far better than living blindly out there. What are you trying to say, Lady Yuriyuki? Itaki asked. First of all, just call me Yuriyuki, and secondly, take it as picking the better choice of two last options. This is no heaven, you know that, but it can be the next thing to peace you can find. She suddenly stopped and looked Itaka dead in the eye. You journeyed straight to the Siridei, even taking your time slowing down not because you are desperate for information but to explore the only choice you have in death. Choices. She nodded. Yes. A peaceful life in the Rukonga, or a semblance of normalcy in the Siridei. How do I know? It's something most war-hardened warriors have a problem with at the end of every war. Chapter 32, Dilemma of Freedom Itaka stared at the bright full moon while sitting on the branches of a tree, his thoughts a mystery to anyone, if they were watching, and even himself. It has been over two weeks since he joined the Godi I-13, 2nd Division and like what he had expected, the feeling of loss never left. It was easy to forget when he was always on the move during his journey from the Rukonga 69th District but after settling down in one place for the longest time since his death, the feeling slowly started creeping back and now all he could do was leave it there to permeate as he knew not what to do with it. Sure he was back in a military organization like his former village, that was a placating thought, but it still felt different. Maybe it was because there was no tension between the Shinigamis and other opposing powers or maybe because a special group of people weren't planning to plunge the world in a dreamscape, but there was something that was missing from the soul society in contrast to the elemental nations. Your mind, he heard Tsukuyomi's voice in his head, something that rarely happened unless he was the one wishing to talk to it. It illuminates a fading hue. How lost can you be under this peaceful moonlit night, Itaki? By the sage if I know that myself. He replied. For some reason, the moon seemed a lot less bright after his reply. Maybe it was his expectations of the afterlife that left him this lost as the eternal torment of the shameful yet hopeful reunion he thought would be his due was nowhere to be found. Having lived his life as a mission since his time in the academy at a tender age of six to his death at a young premature age of twenty-one, facing the probability of living eternally in such an afterlife, maybe it isn't such a surprising thing that he feels blindly adrift in a sea of unknowns. He died when his life was just starting and now here he was, 
a free and unknown man, having nowhere to go and nothing to do. Possessing drive but lacking purpose. Even under its illuminating light, why do I feel so lost? Why are my paths not visible under its shine? Why Tsukuyomi? He said it dryly, not because he was masking his innermost thoughts but because that was the only way he could say it. Cry? Why would he? The two times he remembered crying felt so far, so far in the moments of his greatest regrets. Here in the afterlife, away from everything that made him Itaki of the Leaf, he was no longer the talented Itaki, he was no longer the Uchiha prodigy, not the most loyal ninja his village has ever seen, not the leader of his clan, not the eyes of Lord Third, not the shadow protector of the hidden leaf village. Here he was just Itaki. A strong reincarnated soul in the afterlife. He who was molded to be the perfect tool, having finally found himself free could only find himself staring blankly with no idea what to do with it. You don't have a purpose, Itaki? Let it come to you. There is no shame in remaining clueless for a while. You who have never been a person of the heart, always foregoing your own desires for duty, with such a choice of freedom presented, will no doubt fail to find it. As a being that was part of his soul, even during his time as a ninja, Tsukuyomi understood exactly what it was that left Itaka so hollow. They were one and the same after all. Itaka sat straight on the tree branch with his legs freely swinging behind him while his hands hung out towards the moon as if he wanted to feel it in his hands. My desires hey. He couldn't even laugh freely at the irony of his situation. All he ever desired was lost, dead, and the last one till alive in the elemental nations, yet only now did his desire matter. What did he desire? Family? Truth? Peace? I'll try, Tsukuyomi. All I ask is be patient with him when I fail. He said. Will you fail? Make your choices, and we'll make sure to stick with you all the way. Tsukuyomi gave his final reply as his presence receded back into the depths of the illusory world. Taking a last look at the moon, Itaka made a silent promise to himself before jumping off the branch. The next morning, garbed in standard Shinigami attire, Itaka walked through the roads of the second division as he headed to Yoruyuki's office along with a few other Shinigamis who were heeding the captain's call. They were led to the back of Yoruyuki's office where they all stood straight in sharp lines before the languidly reclining captain. Itaka was a bit thankful to Yoruyuki as actions these past few weeks were nothing short of consideration, mostly leaving him to his own devices or having short private conversations with him. Mostly trying to get him to open up or having Swa FON clear up a few of his questions and having her show him around. Since you all are aware of the recent hollow activities springing up in the Rukonga, I want to inform you that you all will be working overtime from now on with the divisions you find yourself aiding. From henceforth, whenever in the field you are required to maintain hourly check signals between cells. Any cell that fails to do so on time without the excuse of being in combat will face extreme discipline corrections. Despite the relaxedness in her posture and voice, the intent she carried made every single Shinigami too tense to even let out a flinch. While he hadn't been an active member of the division since he joined due to Yoruyuki's discretion, she couldn't just put him in a cell squad when she knew his abilities and style could potentially disrupt his teammates and even suppress their efficiency. Swa FON will notify you of the date of your departure and members of your group. Dismissed. The Shinigamis cleared out of her backyard except for Itaka who she directed her gaze at to stay. Honestly, there's no way I'm grouping you with anyone, except maybe Swa FON, mostly because of your abilities. I'll still need a guide since I'm clueless about the Rukonga. Itaki replied. Hearing his reply, Yoruyuki smiled and sat up a little straighter. Oh? You are ready to go back to the field? I admit I want you around me to run errands rather than in the field since I can't burden my dear Swa FON for everything. Carrying out your orders is not a burden, Lady Yoruyuki. Swa FON, who had been silently standing behind Yoruyuki, spoke up seriously. How could serving her lady be considered a burden? I have no objections either way. Itaka said. After another thinking session the previous night, and thanks to Tsukuyomi, Itaka realized that he could ease himself back into it. About the hollows, is this a reoccurring thing? He couldn't help but ask. The two women fell silent, with Swa FON looking genuinely curious while Yoruyuki tapped her chin, humming a soft tune to herself. Honestly, I have no idea. It's not as if there's rhyme or reason to most of their actions. But something like this is very rare, first time I've seen it like this. All they do is hunt souls to eat, hollow, shinigami, and everything in between. Got an idea what is going on? Itaka shook his head. 
I don't know that much about the Shinigamis to establish a behavioral pattern or give an educated opinion but I think it's easy to tell that there's a cause behind it. Not a spontaneous occurrence like some might think. Maybe something might have happened in the dimension they reside in. We've been monitoring hollow activities in Hueco Mundo and so far nothing weird is happening over there. Yuriuaki said offhandedly while standing up. Swa FON will probably be your guide for this mission. As well as my supervisor and examiner. Itaka helped her complete the words she left unsaid but she shrugged uncaringly. You understand so no need to point it out. She said, her voice fading as she walked farther away before disappearing in a blur. Itaka turned to Swa FON who felt a bit uncomfortable under his calm look. When do we leave? She let out an awkward cough and replied a little anxiously than she would have liked if she had paid a little attention to how she acted when he spoke. Yes, um, I'd rather we leave today. It's mostly investigations we'll be carrying out so we are likely to spend up to a week on the field. Itaka nodded and turned around to leave, giving his remark as he faded away. Let me know when you're ready. Seeing how he left, Swa FON looked disgruntled not understanding why her Yuriuaki sama would want to put up with someone like Itaka whose eyes looked like he didn't put anyone in them. Oh right. She went after him because of me. Chapter 33, An Unusual Phenomenon I Itaki and Swa FON left their barracks as soon as Swa FON was done with her arrangement for the rest of the squad, neither one being the type to waste time dilly-dallying when a mission was up. With Swa FON leading the way with her expert mastery in Shunpo, Itaka silently followed beside her having no problems keeping up with her, much to her consternation. Despite all that had happened, Swa FON never outright said it, but Itaka's presence rattled her a great deal despite how much she tried to hide it. She herself could not understand why because as a Shinigami, she was used to death and have on more than one occasion, found herself on the harrowing edge of death, so it didn't make any sense that she was still plagued by those memories. The Hollows how easy is it for them to get into the soul society? Itaki asked. The expression on her face was cold and calm, not letting stray thoughts influence her actions when on a mission. Quite easy, but they don't do it often. Why? Because just like how it is suicidal for any random Shinigami to enter Hyoko Mundo, so also it is for Hollows here. Granted, we can't cover all of the Rukonga since we severely lack the numbers, but we are always monitoring the state of the souls in soul society to know if something is wrong. It was a loose security system which led to the sharp deteriorating state of the Rukonga but there was nothing they could do as the Soul Society was just too big for a few thousand Shinigami to act as security guards. The details of this mission. Itaki asked. Swa FON eyed him but he didn't react to it, just keeping his head straight as they traveled. Her job was to supervise him and note any peculiarities he had when it came to deferring to authority, delegated or otherwise. Nothing important. It's a mission. The details are always important. Itaki remarked, coming off somewhat strict. As far as they understood, even if Yuriuaki didn't say it out loud, this was Itaki's mission more than it was Swa FON's. She was at the very least his guide, and at most his probation officer. Swa FON was somehow shaken but she refused to let any of it show on her face, not knowing that Itaki could read her quite easily. He didn't care for her apprehension towards him as all he was here to do was learn. Even for him. This was a new route he was taking as there was never a time, since he had learned how to read, that he was completely clueless of the things happening around them. They stopped at the valley of a mountain range, still staring at each other until Swa FON turned away with an irritated huff. An entire settlement of souls suddenly disappeared and the tracks there showed that there was little to no struggle when it happened. It looked like they suddenly turned to smoke and fizzled away. I see. Then let's go. Itaka nodded, already aware of what his role was at least what Yuriuaki was expecting from him. All he needed were the details to know exactly what his mission was. He would never have reduced himself to playing ninja for someone if what he wanted wasn't something he deemed to be of equal importance. It also helped that Yuriuaki was honest in her dealings with him which made it easier for him to reduce himself low enough to defer to her authority. Swa FON kept her thoughts to herself as she watched Itaki almost shoulder to shoulder with her as they traveled, solely focused on his mission and nothing more. West Rukonga 37th District. The two of them arrived at the small settlement tucked away to one side of the base of a mountain, carefully noting everything they came across. They were not the only ones here, Itaki understood, and before long Swa FON had brought him man in charge of this specific site. Hey, Swa FON. Nice to see you out here, and along with him I see. 
Kisuk Kirahara greeted them as they arrived at the center of the town where a serious looking Kisuk stood while looking around. Captain Urahara, Lady Yuriuaki sent us to be of assistance. Swa Fon said. I'm aware, though she didn't tell me she was sending him over. But I guess that doesn't matter. Kisuk said before beckoning them to follow him. This part of the town is the most populated but there is nothing here to tell us, or even give us an idea of what happened here. They disappeared just like the others. He said as he brought them to a spot where there were multiple footprints. Do you notice anything? They were aware of what was happening to them, but weren't fast enough to avoid it. Itaka said as he looked at the mismatched set of footprints on the ground. Care to explain? Kisuk asked. The prints. Itaka started. It didn't start here at the center, this just happened to be where most of the people were when it happened. So they noticed lately and were too slow to react? But that should leave some kind of trace considering the range and time it took effect, no? Swa Fon asked. Probably. I'm not the expert on souls so there's not much I can say. Itaka said. Where are you going? Kisuk inquired as he saw Itaka leaving them there. To case the area. Itaka said before disappearing, eliciting an interested gaze from Kisuk. Quite a neat movement technique. He commented. And with that scowl on your face, I can tell that you're not exactly thrilled with his presence in the second. MMPH. He's selfing and too conceited. Just because Lady Yuriuaki is accommodating towards him to some extent doesn't mean he should take advantage of her kindness. She said sullenly and turned to leave. You really have a knack for finding them, Yuriuaki. He chuckled and afterwards his face got serious as he went back to work. This was a pretty serious issue after all. Looking over the small village, Itaka keenly observed every detail he could find and they were actually few and almost useless. From what he had learned Swa Fon and Yuriuaki during his few weeks in the Siridei, everything in the Soul Society was made of spirit particles, both living and non-living. Given that these were energy particles, it only made sense that Itaka was able to see them with his Sharingan. He finally figured out why it felt like his visual prowess was on hyper mode any time he used it and that was because all he was seeing was solidified energy blocks. In a rough sense, all the physical things like ground, trees, their bodies, even water, was all made up from the building block energy particle called Raishi. And that was what he was focusing on. In a way, it made his investigation harder and easier at the same time. Since the souls faded away into Raishi, it made it very hard for him to pick out the difference, like trying to separate water from water. Now if he could pinpoint any difference from the normal Raishi-infused atmosphere then it wouldn't be that much of a problem anymore for him to pick up a trail. But what happened here? Were they absorbed as energy or was it something that targeted living souls in particular? Itaka thought, always reminding himself to keep an open mind when it came to Shinigami and Hollows. Hollows really are dangerous. This print, this person likely noticed what was happening but before they could continue their leap step, the same thing they saw happened to them. It was a long and disproportionate footprint and it wasn't the only one he had found. He had made notice of these types of prints when he and Swa Fon entered the village more of them at the center area and few sparse ones in some parts of the city done. Swa Fon, who was watching Itaka from a distance, curiously made herself unseen, intrigued on what Itaka was going to do. She saw him close his eyes and when he opened it again, gone were his back eyes and in their place were a pair of red eyes with three dotted patterns on them. Those eyes again. What are they? She thought, taking extra steps to make sure her presence was as thin as possible so he wouldn't notice. With his sharing gone active, Itaka scanned the area again and focused on areas with some degree of energy fluctuation. That's weird. The energy particles were broken into smaller blocks. If it's a hollow attack then it was one big enough to cover the whole place in split moments. But I can't tell if it eradicated them in an instant or if it first immobilized them before destroying them. Something doesn't feel right. Chapter 34, An Unusual Phenomenon 2 the slight frown that was supposed to be on Itaka's face to show just how skeptical he was of the current scenario, though it wasn't present, it didn't matter because that was how he was feeling. Though under different and unavoidable circumstances, he was back in his element and his intuition was hinting at this being something bigger. Maybe the hollows are working under a hierarchy because this isn't the first case of missing souls. If not the hollows, then maybe an enemy force, the nobles, or even a crazy Shinigami. Given the surface acquaintances Itaka had with Yuriuaki, and in extension the Shinigami, everyone was up for suspicion from Itaki. He looked at a particular spot in general with his Sharingan and three seconds later Swa Fon appeared before him, 
not displaying an ounce of shame at being caught spying on him. The Hollows, do they have a hierarchical slash military structure? He asked after his eyes faded back to his normal black ones. Not necessarily. I did hear Lady Yuriuaki talking one time about how there seems to be some kind of hollow leader but he doesn't rule all hollows, more like he has the most hollow followers. Some hollows do travel in groups but they are very few who prefer that. Swa Fon answered, looking at Ataka scrutinizingly but unable to glean anything from him. Did you find anything? She couldn't help but ask at the end when Ataka made no effort in explaining further. Nothing much for now but it could turn out to be something major if it proves true. He said. Swa Fon withheld a snort but made what she thought obvious with the derisive eye roll she shot him. Itaka's thoughts however were somber because like what he asked her on their way here and her reply of the Soul Society watching for any abnormal spirit activity and acting to it birthed a few thoughts in Itaki upon his brief reading of this site. Either they are bypassing their sensors every single time or someone is helping them do it. The former is the best case scenario while the latter is entirely plausible but not desirable. He also remembered that Hollow's weird behavior a few weeks ago and how it reacted to the passing Shinigami presences when they entered a certain distance range. Will you at least tell me something so that I don't just stand here looking like the dumb one? Itaka stared at the angrily whining lieutenant and just pointed at the set of footprints around them and calmly questioned her. See it. If you are asking about the slightly irregular prints and the obvious handprint of someone falling and struggling to get up, then yes. She crossed her hands and answered Itaka matter of factly also a bit irritated that he was asking her something obvious. Conclusions He asked again. He wasn't trying to be a show-off or mock her for anything. Rather what he was trying to do was understand how good her sensory aptitudes were and use her as a low-budget blueprint for others in the Cyridei. Probably the same as you came to. Reasons and possible outcomes He pushed the door to a house open and saw that there were three plates of food on the table. Swa Fon stomped into the same house and walked to attack his front glaring mildly at him. What is the point of all these questions? He looked down at her, almost tempted to point out how easily irritated and impatient she was but refrained from doing so as she was Yuriuki's charge, hence the purple-haired woman's responsibility to teach. Your sensors, the ones you said watches the spiritual activity in the Rukonga, were not able to pick it up until a few days after. Also there's the fact that no Shinigami or civilians were survivors of these particular events. Swa Fon's sarcastic retort paused as she started thinking of how these disappearances came to be and the reason why it irritated Yuriuki so much whenever the matter was brought to her desk. Not just the weak civilian souls, even the disappearance of the few scouting Shinigami groups were so abrupt and sudden that no conclusive picture have been construed up to help them understand what was happening. Was that why you asked how we monitor soul activities across the Rukonga? even about their leadership structure. You think this is something bigger than just a few powerful hollows attacking us Shinigami? She held her chin in contemplation but no matter how she thought of it, it all came back to her initial thoughts. Since I don't know that much about the hollows, I can't really say. What I can say is believing it's just hollow interference is a little bit too narrow-minded. Itaka pointed out while he slowly walked around the house. He noticed one of the spoons by the window and one of the chairs being halfway pushed back. They also saw it and died just as helpless. So what are you trying to say? I'm afraid I still don't understand. It's not what I'm trying to say but what I'm thinking. And I'm not the only one thinking that, am I, Captain Urahara? Swa Fon turned in surprise to the door creaking open to show a bashfully smiling Kisuk leaning against the wall on the outside. You're quite something, young man. He said while stepping into the room and bending his head down a bit to avoid bumping his head over the top of the wall. And while I can agree with you, the problem still remains that we have little to no clue on what is happening. So, care to share any thoughtful insight you might have? I don't have any concrete insight at this point but, as I'm sure you also know, it was something that broke the Raishi building block of the normal civilian soul and either vaporized them on the spot or immobilized them for them to be moved away. Hmm, I see. Kisuk nodded as that was pretty much the same conjecture he thought up. It's a bit tricky but that's pretty much all we got to work with. But just for clearance sakes, what do you think is the lead chain event of all this? Kisuk was smiling, lips stretched to their limit but the look in his eyes reflected none of the jovial expression he usually wore. Itaka bent down and picked up the fallen spoon and set it on the table and also arranged the chairs just for the sake of it. It's either one of a few things, or even all of them. A very specialized hollow, strong individuals from the Rukonga or one from the Siridei working with a hollow. Wa double exclamation mark. 
how can you say something like that? Swa Fon chided a bit tamely. It's not as if it wasn't something that couldn't happen. The working with Hollow's part might be a bit questionable but all in all a valid one. Like I said, it's just a thought. Itaka said to Swa Fon before then turning to Kisuk who was sporting a very peculiar smile. Is that enough for you, Captain Urahara? Ha ha ha, of course it is. Thanks for satisfying my curiosity. I'll be taking my leave first then. He said and turned to leave to tend to his ongoing work piling to his desk. The remaining two of them didn't remain idle and left too, Swa Fon trailing Itaka this time as this was her mission observing Itaki. With his sharing gone active, Itaka surveyed the area of the village and the surroundings but ended up with nothing. There's very little for us to do here. Is this the only place we have to be at? Itaki asked after hours of searching and coming up with nothing, even with his sharing gone. It is but there's a few places we could case if you're up for it. I'll have to notify HQ about this little change and get confirmation before we think of leaving. Swa Fon radioed back to the 2nd Division and upon receiving Yuriyuki's direct permission, she and Itaka left Kisuk and made their way towards the closest stealth core group. How many of these disappearances happened in the last few weeks? So far? Two. She replied succinctly. There could be more but we can't be sure. Itaka nodded and employed his body flicker faster, forcing Swa Fon to up her shunpo to keep up with him. With how much he's seen the shunpo in action, Itaki already knew how to do it but he didn't bother as his body flicker didn't lose to anyone's shunpo. It also felt more seamless to do than the shunpo. Looks like I'll be focusing on the hollows and any other powered species out there that the Siridei has records of. If even the captains are lost on this then there is the possibility of something more happening in a background that no one is aware of. He wasn't regretting his choice, he wouldn't, and the feeling of going back on a mission wasn't one he enjoyed nowadays, at all, but there was little he could actually do. Chapter 35, An Unusual Phenomenon 3 Swa Fon didn't lie when she said it would take a while before they got there, and neither did Yuriyuki when she said the mission might take a few days because that was what it took. Since there were a few reports of hollows out there and with some teams killing while the others investigated, Itaka would spend a few seconds to a minute watching the group of Shinigami battling the Hollows before he would leave. It wasn't like he was fascinated with the Hollows, no. To him it was nothing more than a passing interest that he knew would wane fast once he started learning about them. It was an opportunity to learn something new and Itaka had always been a curious one since his childhood days. For the few days they spent traveling together, Swa Fon was gradually becoming less spooked by Itaki and his mannerisms. There were soft trembles here and there and the occasional gasping out of a nap, but she was getting her shit together and she was happy for it. Did Lady Yuriyuki send us together because she knew this would happen? She's just too kind. Lady Yuriyuki. On Itaka's side of the coin, he already knew what was up with her after watching her for a few days after his admission into the second division. He didn't do anything or say anything concerning that as it was something he knew she would grow out of it. And that was what she was doing, albeit slowly. When they finally arrived at their destination, Itaka saw that it was an old Shinigami outpost which was still in use by present Shinigami as somewhere to lay off during missions. It didn't take Itaka long to notice that something was wrong with this place when compared to the other location they had been to. What did you find? She tensed when she saw Itaka's expression go taut after he made a circle over the outpost. Did something happen here? Knowing that his eyes were somehow special and he could see the lingering trace of Raishi particles and Ryatsu, she expected him to say something that should have been hard to believe but instead his words were the direct opposite. Nothing. There's nothing here. Absolutely nothing. He said. His eyes took in every single thing in its range of vision with keen cognizance, missing nothing in its focus. And yet he could find nothing. Itaki, what do you mean nothing? Would you look that serious if it was nothing? She was puzzled. Was the nothing he said a context of something she was failing to understand? The Shiakush lying around are the only signs they were ever here. Everything else says otherwise. He stated. Swa Fon shook her head slowly, still not understanding what he meant but let him continue with what he was doing as his help was the only thing to a clue they had. Itaka stood in the middle of the output, frowning at how peaceful the Raishi atmosphere was. Unlike water mixing with water, like the other one did, this one either spat it out or completely deleted it. Something isn't right here. He said pointing at the four strewn across Shiakush lying about. The Raishi and Ryatsu in a Shinigami's body is folds above that of the normal average soul out there and given that they are Shinigami, they should have been able to at least react for a while before dying but that did not happen. 
nothing. You mean that they didn't see what happened? Swafon asked tentatively. Bringing his two hands together in a praying sign, Itaka closed his eyes and Swafon went a few feet back as she felt his riot so flow in a faux clam state. She didn't have to ask him what he was doing when his riot so burst out like a wave in all directions. Itaki released his riot so in two more bursts, each bigger and fiercer than the one before them. What the hell is he doing now? She would have berated him for what he was currently doing had this been the first week she knew of him, but Itaki wasn't careless. That much she had grudgingly come to accept in such little time she's known him. Itaki released his hands, his eyes still a gleaming red as they looked at the charged air of riot so and turbulent Raishi. Why were you doing that? Swafon asked. It's easier to sense another's energy than one's own, but it's easier to manipulate yours than another's. I released my Ryatsu in concentrated bursts to supercharge the spirit particles in the air so when I try to connect with my own Ryatsu infused atmosphere, it'll be easier for me to identify everything different from my own energy. He explained slowly for her to understand. Despite her initial brash and prudish behavior, she did her best in answering him so far so telling her something simple in return was no deal to Itaki. Not to mention that this was something he learned from Suzuki during their fight when his younger brother hit him with that lightning jutsu, Kirin. It worked on the same principles after all. So like a magnet. Basically. Once again Itaki observed the Raishi particles and Ryatsu in the air but no matter what he did or how he tried, the results were the same. This is unsettling. He muttered to himself. The unknown was always a danger to everyone and this was something that could kill a Shinigami without them or anyone knowing was more than unsettling. How many groups ran investigation on West Rukonga from District 37th? He suddenly asked. Why do you want to know? Swafon asked back. It didn't need to be said that the mission details of other teams aort from one's own was classified information, especially an investigation mission like this one. This is the North Rukonga 24th District. Do you understand now? His voice was calm and low as he spoke, hardly ever in a hurry. Hey? What does that HAV wait? If this is the same hollow then it's traveling districts, back and forth and Swafo and eyes widened, turning to Ataki and staring at him in shock. This was frightening to say the least. It's clearly getting stronger and the scene on West Rukonga could be considered messy work when compared to this. Not only that, from the time of their mission and the time they lost contact falls within a specific time frame along with the one over at West Rukonga. They are hiding their tracks and diverting attention. He said. This is too smart and clean for a single or small group of hollows work. That is if it's still a hollow. Itaka said as he jumped onto the branch of a tree and used a slight tilt of his head to signal Swafon. Let's go. There's nothing here. Without waiting for her response, Itaka blurred away, with Swafon following closely behind him. Since it was a simple recon mission, there was nothing more for them to do and given that he already went to both, his mission had long since been established. Mission complete. Reporting in. Did I really miss it this much? Like always, the answer that should have otherwise been easy for everyone else was an internal journey of retrospection for him. It didn't bother him as much now but it still was an answer he had to give. They arrived at the Siridei and went straight to Yoruyuki's office, knocking and entering after Yoruyuki's amused tone ushered them in. Unlike Swafon who knelt down and head bowed as she reported to Yoruyuki, Itaka just stood a few feet behind her. Thankfully. Yoruyuki wasn't the type of person stuck on rules and formalities and Itaka wasn't sure that he would be swearing his loyalty to anybody or any power anytime soon. Hearing all what Swafon had to say, Yoruyuki nodded at her to stand up to which the girl obeyed, and then turned to Itaki. Got anything to add from your point of view? I hear you have quite the fascinating trick up your sleeve. Her head was propped up by one of her hands while her legs were crossed, regarding both of them with both a welcoming and amused smile. This guy he's definitely the cream of the crop. And to think he was just 21 when he died. I have nothing much to say. Though I doubt the hollows are the only thing you have to worry about. Yoruyuki nodded, understanding his warning of caution. I understand. I think I'll have a talk with Ishin and old man Kukaki after this. Why don't you guys go back and rest while I go talk with the captains? We'll have our work cut out when I'm back. Yes, Lady Yoruyuki. MMN. With the conclusion of those words, Itaka left the two women and made way to his abode. Instead of sleeping, he propped down in a cross-legged meditation pose and pushed his consciousness back into his mindscape. Chapter 36, Basis for Trust 2 
Sparks flew across the small courtyard as Itaki and Swafon clashed blades in the former's courtyard. Swafon's face was matted with sweat as she struggled to predict Itaki's movements. He wasn't using his illusion and even without it, she had to put her all into her senses so as to quickly pick up on his movements and have enough of a split moment to react before he started another one. Conclusion, he was a very skilled fighter. He didn't emanate power or any overwhelming presence, even though he had those in respectable spades, he relied more on subtle skills than pure power. Parrying her blade, he tripped her balance with his legs before throwing her over. I told you that you could use your shikai. Swa Fon frowned and looked at her blade but shook her head. Suzumi Baki isn't exactly spar friendly. How so? It works on two hits, right? Swa Fon's facial muscles twitched violently at Ataka's statement. What exactly are you trying to say? That I can't land two hits on you. I'm not saying you can't hit me twice, Itaka stated calmly, it'll be hard for you to hit me in the same place twice. She wanted nothing more at this moment than to call on Itaka's bullshit but she couldn't as even painting a mental image of stinging him in the same place twice was hard for her. She could only admit to Itaka's genius and strength and Yuriyuki's suggestion against Itaki attending the Shin Academy with how fast he was picking up Kid. At least he isn't like that bum of a Captain Urahara. She thought taking an uncomfortable comfort in the choice between two lesser evils. While she didn't like Itaki and his self-centered attitude, especially in the presence of Lady Yuriyuki, she couldn't deny that he was a capable fighter. Are we continuing, or are we done for the day? Itaki asked. Oh, um, do you have anything planned out for the day? She asked a little hesitantly. Apart from Lady Yuriyuki who was hardly ever free, Itaki was the only one in the second division that she could safely practice against. Not necessarily. He said, I was thinking of doing a little research and maybe visiting the 8th. Captain Kiraku. Yes. He keeps reminding me to visit any time we come across each other. The captain was clearly an eccentric one and Itaka had little to no success when dealing with those types. His relationship with Kisame was a prime example of that. Well then, come on. Itaka beckoned her with his sword. They clashed again and a light show of sparks blossomed in the small courtyard. Even among ninjas he knew, someone of Swa Fon's caliber was ranked at higher levels. Most jonans would have trouble keeping up with her speed and lethal strikes, especially how her fighting style was centered with her Zanpaka in mind. Her shikai, Suzumibaki, was fashioned like a gold and black stinger covering her entire middle finger and wrist. Like an epithet of a stinging butterfly, its abilities granted Swa Fon to instantly kill any opponent that she stabs twice on the same spot with the stinger. This caused her entire fighting style to be focused on giving the maximum lethality damage she could deal with every single one of her strikes. Itaka used the hilt of his sword to stop a low cut from Swa Fon, much to her surprise as his hands were just centimeters away from where her blade impacted the hilt. Unfortunately for her, not that she was ever told, but Itaka was someone who also preferred the one-hit kill tactic. She withdrew her sword, half expecting Itaka to do the same but he surprised her again when he simply twisted his wrist and brought his blade down on her, forcing her to hastily block amidst her retreat. Showing her off again in a display of superior experience, Swa Fon let out a confused exclamation as her blade simply pushed his blade back into the side with practically no resistance, prompting her to stumble forward and her already shaken balance further deteriorated. She could only sigh irritably as she felt attack his blade on her back. He didn't have to point out her little mistake as she was fully aware of it. She didn't need him to teach her fighting styles or correct her flaws, she could do that on her own against an equally strong slash stronger opponent which she had in him. They were both experienced warriors after all. She picked herself up once more and they clashed again. The first division. In the meeting hall of the captains, Yamamoto and three other captains were having a discussion about the bizarre and worrying event that had happened in the Rukonga. This is different. Shinigami dying to hollows is a normal fact that even ignorant souls in the academy are aware of. But that's not what this looks like. The one who spoke was Kisuk, a rather serious frown on his face different from the normal bored and jovial expression his facials expressed. With him were Yuriyuki and Kiraku, and just like him both bore taut expressions on their faces as they went over the data both the research division of the 12th and the stealth corps of the 2nd brought back. Those Shinigami who disappeared didn't put up any kind of fight, or perhaps had no idea that there was need for one. It simply attacked the Raishi construct of their soul bodies and from there nothing else. Yuriyuki stated. Kiraku scratched his side beards and adjusted his straw hat to the periphery of his eyes. Raishi? I hope you're not insinuating what it is I'm thinking. 
This time it was Kisuk who shook his head. It was not caused by Quincy's, that I'm almost fully sure of. If it were them, they would have left a Raishi charged atmosphere to trace it back to them but this wasn't it. Kiraku sighed, looking distressed. Though it wasn't clear what was causing his distress. It could be a myriad of things or little to nothing, who knew? What are your thoughts based on what you've found out? Yamamoto questioned the three of them as their divisions were the most active in this particular string of incidents. I do agree with it even if it hadn't been my initial conclusion but my new ward attack seems to think that it's either a coordinated hollow attack, some strong souls from the Rukonga causing trouble, or someone aiding the hollows, that hypothesized someone being a Shinigami. A high-ranking one to boot. Kiso winced at the way Yoruaki plainly spelled it out to the old and terrifying head captain commander, while Kiraku almost choked on the grass stalk in his mouth. Captain Shion, I asked for your educated opinion, not one from a recently reincarnated soul. Are you trying to say that his words can be trusted as tangible enough for the other esteemed captains to adhere to? Not exactly, but it was his words and conjectures that we are currently working with. He was also the one who figured out the breakdown of the Raishi soul body. Yoruaki replied with the same seriousness she's had since the beginning of the meeting. Really? Then don't you find it suspicious that he's the one who figured it out and also how interesting a coincidence it is that these disappearances started in the same time frame as his supposed appearance in the Rukonga? The head captain asked, with one of his eyes fully staring at Yoruaki. Kisuke and Kiriko remained silent and waited for Yoruaki's response which was promptly given after a short nod from her to Yamamoto. With all due respect sir, I never said that attack it wasn't a prime suspect in this case of disappearing souls. Personally, I would say that the reason why he's considered a suspect is the situation surrounding his arrival in the Siridei. She reported. Also for your further enlightenment, Itaki Uchiha has been under strict surveillance, personally supervised by me and no one else, from the moment he agreed to come with me to the Siridei. Yamamoto's passive one eye stare at her remained, not particularly convinced by her words. And how does that do us any good? If he really is the cause behind it or has any connection to it, then his words would be more truthful to accept given that we haven't yet figured out anything from what he could find out. She replied calmly, making sure to stress the if loud and clear enough for Yamamoto to know that she wasn't convinced of any guilty tag on the young man until proven true. Old man Yama, I believe your Yuaki's words, if nothing else, have some merit to it. It's the only explainable proof we have concerning the disappearances. Kiraku chose that moment to interject and provide a shallow support for Yoruaki's words not because he cared that much if the young man was behind it or not, but because like she had said, it was the only lead they had. Chapter 37, Shunsui Kiraku Garbed in the standard Shinigami Shiakush, Itaki walked into the General Information Center, aka Library, in the 2nd Division. After his sparring matches with Swafon which left the lady very conflicted and mildly angry, Itaki went ahead and decides to visit the library before doing anything else. Since he had nothing to do most of the time, he usually spends it reading through books and any other useful pieces of information he could find here. Most of them were about the 2nd Division and the Siridei in general, some Shinigami-centric ones and general history. There were some about hollows but something Itaki noticed about the general information regarding hollows were the classifications of the different hollow types and nothing else. This was information even taught at the academy. Yoruaki once asked him if he ever considered going through the normal education route to become a Shinigami but he refused since he could get the information he would from the academy far easier by being in the second division. Excuse me, but are there any books on the noble houses? He asked one of the librarian he came across. The man looked a little uncertain at Itaka's question, something that didn't escape his notice. Well most information about them are mostly references and mentions. There's nothing else on them in these books apart from that. It's not exactly public knowledge you see. Itaka nodded, going back to his book and only leaving after a few hours of reading. It was one of the few pastimes and luxuries he could enjoy during his Akatsuki days. He decided to ask Yoruaki about it after returning, but before that decided to visit the 8th division and clear the pending invitation, mostly because this was the first time he was visiting another division. Oh, Itaki. You finally decided to share wine with me today, how wonderful. He heard a shout behind him, turning around to see Kiriko waving at him. And also a wine gourd strapped to his waist. Don't tell me you didn't come here to hang out with me and you're on duty. He looked saddened but none of his mannerisms phased Itaki. Call it a sixth sense or something of that nature but this captain, Shunsui Kiriko, along with the head captain and a few other captains felt different to him. Even without proof of any kind, 
he deduced that even between captains, there was a difference between the truly strong captains and those strong enough to be captains. And if he were to be asked where he would place the straw hat wearing man in a flashy kimono in, on pure instincts, he would go with the former. I don't drink. He simply said, causing Kiriko to stare dumbly at him, his frivolously carefree demeanor fading a bit as he adjusted his hat a little higher to show a full view of his face. It's not very respectful to play with the feelings of an elderly man when it comes to sharing a drink. He said. He walked past Ataki and stepped through the gates of his division's barrack, beckoning on Ataki to follow. Meaning you have something to say to me, right? Well don't just stand there. Kiriko led Ataki to the back of a house with trees all around it and led him to the stump of a tree where he unceremoniously plopped to the ground and stretched his hands for Ataki to take a seat. I'm afraid that other than your name and that amazing display you put on when you arrived, I know nothing about you. There's nothing to know. The only thing I have of importance is my name and that happens to be something one gives freely. Itaka said, causing Kiriko to sigh. You know, most people would say their name is one of the most important things they have. Especially when it comes to being a soul. Kiriko said, folding his hands into the sleeves of his kimono. A name is essential to a soul. More so when it comes to being a Shinigami. Itaka didn't say anything to that, could not say anything to it or against it simply turning his head to look at the approaching familiar Ryatsu. Lisa Yudmara walked towards them, pausing slightly at Ataka's presence before giving a respecting nod to him which he returned, and setting down two small sake cups. There are some things I need your oversight on so please don't get hung over in the middle of the day. She said, sighing to herself on seeing the carefree smile on his face that told her he was giving little to no consideration to her words. Nice to meet you again, Itaki Uchiha. Lisa Yudmaru. Lieutenant of the 8th Division. Itaki Uchiha. 2nd Division. He said, his reply more simplified. Please don't let yourself get carried away by his antics. She said before turning to leave the both of them to whatever antics they were up to in the middle of the day. Silently she hoped that Itaki was as moral and level-headed as he appeared. The last thing she needed was someone encouraging her captain to more indulgence. Watching Lisa as she left, Kiriko chuckled and uncorked the gourd and filled the two cups and shifted one towards Itaki. Don't get scared by her. He said as if answering an unasked question, she's just like that until you get to know her. Itaki didn't say anything to that either, having no idea what the captain's reason for saying that was. Well, you came this far already. Out with it, will ye? He took a little sip, closing his eyes as he did to savor the intoxicating taste of a perfectly fermented alcohol. I didn't come here for any particular reason but I do have some questions I wanted your Yuaki to answer for me, but I guess I can peruse your knowledge with your permit. Raising his eyes at Ataki, mildly confused, he asked. Are you stating that or are you asking me? Realizing that he would only be troubling himself with whatever Ataki's answer might be, he stopped him from responding and told him to ask away. The noble houses? Yeah, I do know a few things about them but it's almost the same as what you can get from the libraries. His eyes were half-lidded as he spoke, as if he was speaking of something trivial with little to no importance, but Ataka knew it was the complete opposite. I will ask your Yuaki about it and see if it's some general secret. Ataka thought. I see. Ataka looked down at the cup of sake in front of him and proceeded to pick it up and gulp down the contents. Seeing his action and his immediate reaction, Kiriko couldn't help but laugh. Ha ha ha. You weren't kidding. And here I thought you didn't drink. I don't. Itaki replied. But it's disrespectful to turn down a drink of cordiality from a respected elder, at least where I'm from. Kiriko looked at the young man in front of him with an amused smile. He played the fool most times because that was just who he was the childish games and behavior were a part of him and not just an act and that was why he could see things in a simpler and less complicated way than most people. And that was why Itaki made him amused. Oh your Yuaki is going to have too much fun teasing his cold mask off. Well then. How about joining me every once in a while for a cup? He said and lifted his cup to gulp down the remaining contents, exhaling in contentment as the liquid flowed down his throat. Hopefully the next time you come around, we can watch the moonlit sky. Itaka knew he wasn't much of a conversation person, something Kiriko could tell straight away, and so for the short duration he stayed there, Kiriko was the one who did most of the speaking. The man was a very good conversation partner and storyteller, well he had to be given he was into the millennium in years hence the respect Itaka freely gave. Itaka's thought on him was that he could be a little tricky and somewhat obscure, rarely intense, and a little bit too laid back. His young visage apart, 
Itaka's words about him being a respected elder was true. Chapter 38, Basis for Trust 3 What is the essence of the soul? If the core essence of every living being is the soul, then for souls existing as is, what is the core part of the soul? These arts are really advanced, more so than any jutsu, fundamentally speaking. Those were Itaka's honest thoughts after trying his hand at the art the Shinigami used Kid. Kid was the encompassing term of all the exoteric arts a Shinigami learns during his time in the academy, which is used in conjunction with their own combat abilities for a qualitative roundup. Kid is made up of three different branch of the art. Had the art of destruction. Composed of supplementary and destructive techniques, all capable of terrifying magnitudes of destruction depending on the mastery of the person using it. Because the art of sealing. And just like its name, it is an entire branch made up of supplementary, restraining, sealing and counter-attack techniques. Kide Healing Arts This branch of Kid is focused entirely on healing. Unlike Kide, Had and Bakud had a large and extensive range of different techniques under them, numbering from 0 to 99, excluding special and forbidden techniques. Though it ultimately came down to affinity and aptitude to excel in any area of Kid, the fact that these techniques were open for any Shinigami to learn, offensive, Sealing and healing techniques, already makes the average Shinigami with the minimum affinity for them a more balanced warrior than most he's seen. His genuine surprise was understandable as back in the elemental nations, apart from the basic ninjutsu ninjas learn when still a genin, every other jutsu is a strongly safeguarded secret from everyone else. It was a practice every ninja village had in place that the instance of any high-ranking jutsu falling into enemy hands could literally spark the embers for a war. The destructive and effective range of Hat and Bakud is truly something fascinating. Lightning, fire, ice, energy drain, repel, gravity, space, light, healing, darkness, energy manipulation all these and more were properties that Kid covered. While he wasn't a connoisseur for techniques, finding it wasteful and amateurish to learn an extensive number of techniques and being unable to use a respectable percentage of it in battle, learning how they worked and how to counter them was something he enjoyed doing even as a child. He almost let out a wistful smile at that but the memories that came with it squashed the little bubbling atmosphere around him. The techniques were a lot, 200 plus for Hat and Bakud, but he never thought of learning all of them. If it wasn't something that complements his fighting style, he wouldn't bother learning it, no matter how powerful the technique was. Even before his death, his repertoire of jutsu was very few compared to most of the people he knew. Take Kakashi for example. Even as a child he had the ability of copying his opponent techniques which was possible with his transplanted Sharingan, going over to copy over a hundred techniques and yet he could never draw out a single percentage of that number in a fight. Truly a waste of the eye's abilities in attack his opinion. He pointed one finger at a boulder in the distance and chanted a simple kid spell. One he had seen Yoruyuki, Swa Fon, and Lisa use, having been at the end of it for a comfortable number of times. Had number four, Biakurai. A wave of lightning exploded from his fingertips with his Ryatsu advancing destructively. The lightning wave evaporated the top of the boulder and melted the other parts to molten slag. A basic had spell yet it trumped the basic lightning jutsu most ninjas with lightning affinity use. Such an effective range and potency. And I don't have an affinity for the lightning element. He said to himself. Probably why I can easily use jutsu with similar affinities with these destructive elements. Another thing he was quick to notice about the Shinigami were that most of them with Shikai used kids sparingly, instead focusing more on their Zanpakutes abilities. Yoruyuki and Swa Fon relied on kid and speed in their combat style along with the whole stealth core, that he understood, even though he was yet to see Yoruyuki's with her Zanpakut, this was however not the case with other Shinigami. Even when he was fighting Lisa in front of the captains, he easily noticed how she cut back on using kid spells and switched to creating attacks with her Zanpakut after her Shikai release. Unlike the rest of the Shinigami population, he didn't have to bother with struggling with how to channel his Ryatsu when chanting a kid spell. He spent some of his time learning them while for some, all he needed was a glance at someone using it, at least for the simpler ones. This was why he entertained Swa Fon's request for spars any time they were free, he always made sure to copy the had spells he felt would complement him. I knew I would find you around here somewhere. He didn't turn around at the sudden voice behind him who had her finger pointing at his neck. Aren't you getting too comfortable for me to be able to sneak up on you like this? No. Eh. You were the one who let your guard down, Itaki replied. Yoruyuki stared dumbfounded as she saw her finger pointing at nothing, no not nothing she was pointing her hand the same way Itaka did with his Biakurai, and he was behind her with a finger to her neck in the exact same way and posture she had done to him, 
but without the smug grin which she was no longer wearing. How did you? She looked at him, his zanpakut still in its dormant state sheathed to his waist. Is it? Itaki removed his finger from her neck and put a respectable space between the both of them because you can never tell when your Yuaki wants to lean in for a cat swap as she so aptly put it. You're picking up kid rather well, not like I'm that surprised. She said with a smirk. She had easily figured out that Itaki could not only copy someone's attack pattern mid-fight with nigh perfect accuracy, but also their kid's spells. Though to what limit was what she didn't have an exact answer for. Your Yuaki knowing about his Sharingan abilities meant nothing to him. In his life, all five major hidden villages knew about the ocular jutsu of his clan. He had never considered the basic Sharingan's abilities as a secret worth keeping at all cost. Which meant your Yuaki lost another chance to strong arm and prod him for more answers. Any reason why you were seeking me out in the first place? He asked. She rolled her eyes and wiggled her finger disapprovingly at him. Anyone ever tell you that you're a boring conversation partner to have? Yes. Your Yuaki sighed and temporarily gave up on drawing out more words from him and instead told him what she came here for. Nothing pressing. But I heard that you were asking around for information on the noble houses. Mind telling me why the sudden interest in annoying and stuck-up nobles? Nothing important, just mild curiosity. Itaka said, and continued on smoothly. The watchers you had all over the Siridi I were annoying to lose. Your Yuaki's face didn't display any ounce of expression of surprise to show that she was affected at being found out. You had my best trackers running circles so you don't get to complain. She commented lightly as if giving a passive remark. She looked at Itaki and if she was being honest, he was a walking contradiction of multiple red flags. You're making it harder for me to trust you, Itaki. And is there a reason why you are in a haste to find a reason to trust me? Itaki replied to her statement. Just so I can prove that my choice wasn't wrong and I won't have to kill you for it. She said simply. For a minute, Itaka just stared at her before finally nodding. I can leave if that'll help. But I guess even that won't be as simple as just working through the gates, right? And why do you sound so calm about it all? Because I speculated that something of a similar scenario like this one is a large possibility. Her neutral face staring at him suddenly burst out into a fit of soft giggles. Hold on, tough guy. Your neck is not on the chopping board yet. Is that all you came here for? Honestly, yet. Yeah. She shrugged. A few of the captains don't trust you as a fellow Shinigami. An obvious reaction. He said. He then sighed and regarded your Yuaki with a serious gaze. What do you want from me, your Yuaki? A mission. She replied immediately. She knew he was likely still averse to receiving orders from anyone and the look he gave her said it all investigation. And also a probational test, I assume. He added, both still staring at the other. You have your trackers, don't you? But none of them can pick up energy particles as well as you do. The ones who disappeared. He asked and she nodded. Let's just say it might be more than that and leave it at that. Kisuk thinks there might be a conspiracy behind this, and before you ask, you are not the only one going, but you will be the only one working alone. She finally regarded him with a smile. So? Mind helping a lady out? Itaka's mind had already gone through a string of likely probable things to happen if he took on this mission and they all ranged from but not limited to, ambush, assassination, a public execution, kidnapping, defamation, etc. Chapter 39, The Mission I In a dim room, a bespectacled man wearing the standard Shinigami Shiakush sat in front of a monitor perusing streams of data. To his side were open files and looking at them made him frown a bit before it faded to a bemused expression. A variable at this time? Ain't that a bitch? He heard a hoarse voice to his side and his smile turned into another expression of amusement, but with something vague underneath. It can't be helped. The plan, bare bones as is, was made in a way that it adapts to any foreseeable change. The bespectacled man said to his unseen partner. This is all within calculations. Well, if you said so. His partner said with a chuckle before going silent as if contemplating something. Heard about the new guy from the second? The captain seems to think he is the real deal. He clicked off the monitor with a snort and picked up the files, his eyes trailing with interests to a section of what was written. An illusion type Shikai. I admit I'm a bit curious. He said. Bet you would. His partner said in a patronizing tone. After all. It's almost impossible to find two Zanpakut with the same type of Shikai abilities. 
Though his partner didn't say it, he understood what was being implied, except he wasn't worried. If the captains could easily break out of his illusion, and even know that they were in one, that means that his illusions aren't absolute. You don't have to worry about that. He said smoothly. Just focus on remaining low profile in your squad and keep your ears open for any valuable piece of information. As for the variable, he's on a mission right now. Want me to draw out his abilities? He shook his head. The captains did commend his strength and we wouldn't want to take any chances now, do we? His question was a rhetorical one, or his partner took it as one, but he smiled regardless and nodded in content. I have just the sample to draw his capabilities out. Well, you do you. You're the boss. With those parting words, the stranger's presence disappeared from the room while the man flipped through the report in his hands, a fulfilled smile almost welcoming his face. Now this, this is interesting. West Rukonga, District 17. Itaka's paranoia had tipped over a scale ever since Yuriyuki approached him for this mission. As he currently was, though still lacking, he had basic information of the three worlds where the Shinigami operate, the Living World, Soul Society, and Hyoko Mundo. He was still severely lacking in his knowledge of Kid, especially the Forbidden Ones, but he could do without them, even if learning Kaid would have been a blessing to him. There were still things he was ignorant of, a lot of things, but the basic knowledge was enough for a foundation for someone like him. He even learned that there was another release after the Shikai release a Bankai release the highest qualitative leap in power for a Shinigami and something that all captains had. Just dealing with them using slash not using Shikai is already a stretch. He could leave any time if this turned out to be an ambush, or a jungle execution, like his mind rattled about, but that would mean he had to go through with the mission just to know for sure. He prided himself in being able to read people, and given how long he stayed around Yoruaki and Swa Fon, he liked to believe his read on them were accurate, except that ninjas like them are known to be very good liars. What do you think, Tsukuyomi? Am I being too paranoid? Do you think you are being too paranoid, Itaki? Your cautiousness is warranted, your paranoia understandable. That was not an answer. Why do you need an answer? Tsukuyomi asked. Itaki paused at the question, briefly wondering how comfortable he had gotten with Tsukuyomi that he would ask it for its opinion, something he couldn't remember doing for a long time. Truly a lonely soul. Why do I need an answer? He continuously asked himself. I see. He mused in understanding. If I can't come to an answer then I'll go with any action I choose and deal with the resulting consequences. Itaka fully agreed with the idiom of two heads being better than one, especially when both heads were from the same soil. According to the Yuriuaki's brief, Kisuk was able to reprogram what they used to pick up dense riot so signals and tweak it to read up any disturbances in the natural Raishi atmosphere of the Rukonga and coincidentally, the Raishi atmosphere seemed to have bubbled up more in a specific quadrant of the Rukonga. Shadow Clone Jutsu Summoning two clones and using a cosmetic transformation jutsu, Itaka sent them in two separate ways to fan out and see if they could pick up anything. Yoruaki had given him a device to radio back to the research division of the 12th to request aid, scan for Raishi upsurge, or share information, but he was yet to use it and in caution of being tracked, he gave it to one of the clones and left it to its discretion. Using his Sharingan at intervals, he checked to see if there was anything buffering the atmosphere and so far he's been out of luck. Stopping in the outskirts of a small settlement at the base of a mountain, Itaka thought he could spare some time and see if the locals were talking about anything new, and indeed they were. Turns out, some people have been kidnapped recently and the local mishmash of security personnels couldn't do anything to find them, saying they simply vanished. Itaka didn't spend up to an hour there and continued on his mission after getting that little tidbit. You're getting more comfortable with being a soldier. It was very rare for Tsukuyomi to take the initiative to speak with him, except for a few times where he was mentally troubled, so this was a pleasant surprise, especially his words. I, no. Itaki admitted in a moment of weakness. He couldn't really blame himself as he found himself drawing closer to former habits as time went on inside the second. It wasn't something he told himself he'd do, instead he just found himself automatically gravitating towards it. Even the missions from Yoruaki were the same. Tsukuyomi didn't speak another word, leaving Itaka to his musings and waiting for him to choose whatever he wanted to do. I-T-H-I. His words were cut short with his eyes going darkly cold as he stared in a specific direction where he just lost connection with one of his clones. It was even surprising when his clone didn't know how it died and just simply popped out of existence. Despite it currently being nighttime, Itaka sprang into a run towards the clone, 
activating his body flicker technique to the fullest which caused his body to disappear in a blur that was only seen with his first step. Itaki and his clone arrived at the same time and without exchanging a word, both disappeared after a trail they caught. For it to be able to sneak up on Itaki, even if it was a clone, then its abilities couldn't be underestimated. Unfortunately for whatever it was, Itaka's eyes were capable of seeing the faintest of energy signatures if one knew how to look for it. Unless it was a normal soul, whatever killed the clone couldn't have done so without utilizing their Ryatsu in a way, and that was the trail they got. A very faint thread of Ryatsu that was almost disappearing when they arrived. Flank them. A quick glance to the other and a message was communicated. Hiding is useless. Itaka said and the hollow's eyes behind its mask widened as he saw Itaki in mid-swing, a few centimeters away from its neck. Clang. Itaka's eyes betrayed the faintest of surprise when the hollow backtracked two steps back and parried his sword. However, before it could gloat or press on an attack of its own, the clone appeared behind him with a pointed finger which he slashed down. Bakut number one, Psy. Bakut number one, Psy is a restraining supplementary kid spell that seals the target's movement in a form of invisible chains to attack his eyes. The reaction from Itaki and his clone was instantaneous as both of them chorused their next attack in tandem. Had number four, Biakurai. Had number four, Biakurai. The restrained hollow was hit with two streams of white lightning from both of them, engulfing the spot he was restrained in plumes of fire and lightning. The clone appeared at Ataka's side and they both frowned as they looked at the smoke before it was forcefully blown away with the weapon the hollow held. He 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 he. It laughed sickly as if it was amused by what they just did and further inspection from the shinobi revealed that not only did it escape its bind somehow, it also remained undamaged from their joint attack. Chapter 40, The Mission 2 Shinigami, oh, Shinigami. A thrumming thrill reverberated through its throat as it let out those words full of clarity. And that was enough for Itaka to know that he wasn't just dealing with any kind of hollow. Its speech, how it reacted, and how it escaped its bindings with ease was a dead giveaway that the hollow before him was different from any other hollow he's fought. An Ajitches Hollows as a race are divided into two simple categories, normal hollows and great hollows, commonly known as Minos. Under Minos, there exist three progressive evolutionary paths starting from Jillian's, Ajitches, and then the strongest evolutionary height of a hollow, a Vasto Lord. Each classification is accompanied by a staggering qualitative leap in overall capabilities, most strong enough to fight squarely against lieutenants or even outright kill them. These hollows are specific. He agreed with his clone's words as all the hollows he encountered that were involved with the disappearance of the Shinigami all had stealth traits. Manual selection. He said. Screech. They both jumped back, lucky enough to avoid the weapon in the hollow's hands that suddenly whipped out and smashed where they previously stood. Move. Itaka had barely spoken the word out when the hollow suddenly appeared in front of his clone, a soft glow around his hands and a blue energy ball charging up in his mouth. A zero. Itaki realized. A hollow's innate attack available to them in each step of their evolution. When his clone blocked the hollow's fist with his sword, Itaka's eyes widened as he saw his clone's riot so suddenly breaking out of its body with a crack before the zero engulfed them. Seeing how Itaka's clone simply disappeared in front of its zero, the hollow turned to attack it with what was a displeased expression on its face. Your tricks won't save you, Shinigami. Are you the one responsible for the recent disappearance of a group of Shinigami? He asked. No matter how he looked at it, something suspicious was definitely going on but he just couldn't put his hand on what it was. Who knows? It won't change anything even if I answer your question. The hollow sneered. Maybe I can console you with the name of the last thing you'll see. Drummer Bone. That's my name. The weapon he held started wiggling on the floor like a snake until it crawled up its hands and fused into it. Deciding on a path of action. Itaka twirled the sword around his fingers and ran towards Drummerbone who also met him halfway and punched at his sword with his glowing hand. Uh. Itaka parried the blow expertly and kicked Drummerbone in the head, causing him to stagger a few steps backwards. Inwardly growling in anger, the hollow rushed at him, arms swinging, attempting to force Itaka back with his overwhelming strength but Itaka knew that and he redirected every blow he couldn't dodge there by repeatedly disrupting Drummerbone's flow. After the last strike, Itaka put a healthy distance between them as he noticed something weird about the hollow. Every clash between Itaka's sword and Drummerbone's fist caused Itaka's Ryatsu to flow haphazardly, making him shift his focus to actively keep him Ryatsu in a patterned flow. You can feel it right? Ha 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 ha. Drummerbone laughed hysterically and pushed on his attack with more frenzy. 
Itaki retreated under Drummerbone's assault, prompting more manic glee from the hollow. Tsukuyomi. If you had more subpar control of your Ryatsu, you won't even be able to release your Shikai. Mentally nodding to his Zanpakut spirit, Itaka changed the grip he had on his sword and this simple motion made Drummerbone stop and then staggered until he took a knee. W. Watt. Had number 13, Hanataki. And had spell slammed into its face at point blank range and exploded like fireworks, but when the smoke cleared, there was no sign that Drummerbone took any significant damage from that and attack. His guess was the faint glow around the hollow's hands. You break down the riot so of anything your hands touch and absorb a small quantity of it that isn't harmful, right? Itaka hypothesized. So what? Drummerbone shouted and charged a huge zero that it wasted no time in shooting it towards Itaka, who hastily jumped back as he drew something in the air. Because number 13, Kyokaku. A translucent barrier came in between Itaki and the huge Zero with the force of the explosion pushing him back. Bakut number 4, Hainawa. Another kid spell was released and this one was a spell of binding lightning rope that was shot at Drummerbone as soon as it jumped out the dust cloud with its weapon out of his body. Restrained, Drummerbone fell straight to the ground but Itaka didn't let up the opportunity. Sensing the danger, Drummerbone's hands glowed as he tried to break the binding rope, and he did but he was a second too late as Itaka took one of its hands. The handicapped hollow had barely pulled a hasty retreat when he heard Itaka's voice and saw the Shinigami's eyes turning to a red pattern iris. Terrace, Tsukuyomi. Itaki released his Shikai in tandem with his Sharingan. Its defense, speed, and attack are top-notch and it can disrupt most attacks. But what about an attack that it can't see? With how intimate his Sharingan worked with his Shikai, given that they gave birth to Tsukuyomi. The view Itaka's eyes reflected when he used both at the same time was something only he could appreciate. Red, black, and grey lines weaved together in a never-ending twist and turn that he could pull at any time to set up an illusion. Ryatsu, Ryirioku, and all five physical sensations were all receptive to his illusions. Drummerbone's stump started wriggling as it watched Itaka with caution while it tried to heal up another arm, only to stare gobsmacked as the man in front of him simply fade away like the wind and the next thing it knew was another searing pain as its second hand fell to the ground. Rarg. It shouted in pained rage and blasted balls of Ciro in every direction, even instantly regenerating its hands as it was blinded with rage. Unfortunately. Kaka. It heard the sound of crows and its world turned upside down. Its eyes spun fiercely, causing it to lose its balance more than once, and when everything finally stopped, alarm bells rang in its head. A maze. Everything was a maze. Left and right, up and down. Everything was chaotically joined together so that to tell if one was standing on the ground or in the air was virtually impossible. Kaka. Inky black crows and red dotted eyes flew around letting out dreadful cries. Nothing felt real. Is it real? Or is it an illusion? That had been Tsukuyomi's question to attack it when he first entered his mindscape and beheld the world of crows and darkness under the rays of a red lit moon. It's an illusion, because it once used to be real, now it's not. That had been Ataka's answer. He had refrained from pulling too much of Tsukuyomi's illusory prowess as most of them were tuned, or more compatible with Tsukuyomi's manjiki. Seeing how Drummerbone was flailing around on the ground, unable to even push itself up without falling back down, Itaka knew that the hollow was completely lost in the illusion they were both seeing. As if sensing the danger around it with some kind of animalistic sixth sense, it turned its head at Itaka's direction and threw away all caution as it charged up the biggest zero it could form and let it fly. Faced with the incoming zero, Itaka simply slashed down and for an instant, it felt as if the real world and that of the illusion joined together as a bright red light shone from where Itaka had slashed. As for the Ciro, the moment it got to the point where Itaka had slashed, its direction changed as if nothing happened and it had been traveling in a straight line all along as it sailed back to drummer bone. The hollow in question only stared in shock as its strongest attack simply flew backwards without any lag in its momentum until the Ciro impacted its body. It had tried blocking with its hands but somehow, the position it crossed its hands were not the place the Ciro had landed its hit. Crack. Boom. It had to be said about Drummerbone's hard body as not even its own Ciro could completely destroy its body, but Ataka didn't care, nor did he appreciate it. Had number 11, Tsuzuri Raiden. Channeling the Lightning Kid spell through his blade, Ataka stabbed it through Drummerbone's head and the hollow stilled. Unlike what he was expecting, instead of the hollow to start disintegrating, he felt a small wisp of energy building up inside the body and he quickly retreated to a safe distance. The hollow exploded but unlike the violent explosion Itaka had expected, the wisp of energy simply dissipated only the air. What was? Barely a second, 
not even letting him finish his words, and the ground started rumbling and Ataka could hear roars from the distance, more loudly as they got closer. A Parade of Hollows Chapter 41, The Mission 3 A body crashed through trees violently but it spun its body and skidded a short trail on the ground before coming to a stop. Itaka's breaths were getting a bit labored considering how long he has spent fighting against an army of hollows. He tried calling for backup but like he half expected, the call didn't go through and his mind told him that this was the ambush he was cautious about. There were dozens of hollows chasing him, from the unending number of normal hollows to a sizable amount of over the 100 feet tall Jillians and more than a handful of ajitches. The current scene looked like a herd of elephants trying to stomp on an ant. He had a hard time dealing with the unending barrage of Ciro as it were, not adding the unique ability of the ajitches. How can this many hollows get into soul society without the Shinigami knowing? It was unthinkable for something like this that could be construed as a small-sized invasion. Did they lie about the surveillance in the Rukonga? He had thought so but that didn't make sense. Lying to him would mean they were actively trying to hide something from him and he knew he wasn't that much of a problem for them so that seemed uselessly excessive. Hastily molding his riotsu, he spat out a torrent of flames towards the nearest group of hollows but he doubted the fire killed a lot of them. Circling through his ninjutsu and kid repertoire, he managed to keep his distance from them while also trying to escape. He couldn't put them all inside an illusion as it won't be concentrated enough especially since hollows were creatures of chaotically flowing riotsu, making it even harder to keep them in an illusion compared to the average Shinigami. Throwing up another shield, his sword danced with practiced precision as it cut through some of the hollows that had crashed against the shield. Unfortunately for him, the hollows were the only ones getting hurt at every turn. With how quickly they swarmed anywhere he stopped at as soon as he did, not giving him any reprieve to press another attack until they doled out theirs. The intensity of the one-sided battle got fiercer with every hollow attack and managed to kill that he wondered if their numbers were even going down. Forcefully calming his breaths, Itaki ignored the hot pain in his lungs as the large gulps of air were filtered out slowly. His focus was on the nearest hollow and any incoming Ciro. Rarg. A hollow's shout was cut short as a vertical line separated its facial mask and reduced it to dust and specks of Raishi. He blocked another hollow's tail wipe with his hands and fired off a kid that put a second hole in the hollow's body. He had barely retrieved his blade before a volley of Ciro's was blasted in in direction from the tall black spooky Jillians and he only escaped being singed with a well-timed substitution jutsu which gave him another chance to touch a hollow's mask with his palm and release a stream of lightning that disintegrated the hollow's head. His last attack had left him open and the price of that was a punch from a spiked clawed hollow that left a deep bleeding wound in his side. Curses. He cursed in his head but only let a lone twin see rest upon his face as he pushed himself up. They are getting smaller. I can see it now. He motivated himself. Even if large illusions for a rowdy crowd were inadvisable, the basic abilities of his sword showed its worth during this fight. Simple things like hiding the trajectory of his sword or lengthening it earned him the little room he had to organize himself a dive into the fray again. He wasn't stupid. Of course not. The first hollow, drummer bone, had been turned into a hollow bait upon its death which meant that someone must have planned it in the event of a likely situation occurring. It's unlikely that it's the Soul Society trying to kill me because this method is too convoluted and it's not a certainty that it'll kill me. Too much theatrics for someone not considered a threat. He contemplated his situation even as he dodged and hacked away at the now thinning herd of hollows. It's almost too clear that someone is working with hollows, highly likely that they are part of the Soul Society, Shinigami, Captain, or from one of the noble families. If so, then was the bait for me, or for anyone who killed that specific hollow. Itaki was quick to realize that the momentum the hollows had chased after him forced him to withdraw from his former location and scope out where they came from. If that was planned to or not, he had no idea. He heard the reverberating sound of a hollow's high-speed movement to his side and a small crank of his neck gave him view of a hollow he quickly put under Genjutsu as it was the only one near. Changing strategy, Itaki started kiting them as he started running in a circular manner. With the slow Jillians at the back, also being the ones firing most of the Ciro, Itaka made a beeline for them while cleaving through any of the weaker hollows that came near him. He was hit, flung to the side, blasted and almost stepped on, leaving him bruised and injured, but he did his best and closed the distance between him and the huge Minos and also pushing away any of the Ajitches that came near him. He used Kyokaku, a Bakud spell, as a platform that he jumped off of and sailed towards the group of dumb and idly standing Jillians. Had number 4, Biakurai. He said the incantation and poured his riot so through it opening up a wide beam of lightning that destroyed the first Jillian and moved on to the next, destroying it too and moving up to a third which it also destroyed before it receded. 
using the falling body of one of the Jillians to break his steps, his hands blurred into a series of hand signs in a single moment which was followed by him sucking in a vacuum of air before releasing it as a great ball of fire. Fire style, great fireball jutsu. Ye lord. Mask of blood and flesh, all creation, flutter of wings, ye who bears the name of man. Inferno and pandemonium, the sea barrier surges, march on to the south. Head number 31, Shaka. Rather than a simple spell, Itaka went with the full incantation which bolstered up the power of the kid spell by a few folds and fired it at the falling fireball before swiftly disappearing from the vicinity. Upon the spell impacting against the fireball, a red and orange explosion rocked the entire landscape, uprooting rocks and trees and turning the geography to a barren land of boiled glassy sand. Staring at the destruction he caused, Itaka's only concern was that it took care of most of the hollows, especially the ajiches which were the primary source of his problems. Stabbing a stray hollow through his mask, Itaka disappeared, backtracking to the general area where he had fought Drummer Bone. Rargha. His sword whipped forward in a curve and stabbed through the hollow's neck before slicing down and through the hollow hole on his chest. While the other hollows tried to close the distance between them and Itaka, Itaka had taken the time to gather his breaths and made a clone that transformed into a crow to scour the nearby areas and see what it could read from the heavy footprints scattered on every corner. I still can't reach them. He muttered with a frown as he looked at the communication device he had snagged from the ground after his shadow clone was destroyed. With the crow trying to pick up a trail, Itaka could now fully commit his focus on killing the herd of hollows, or what remained of them. After over three hours of careful kiting and hit and run tactics, Itaka finally purified all the hollows as the Shinigami called it. He looked worse for wear with some rather telling injuries. Even if he was asked how he survived a parade of dozens of ajichas, Itaka's honest answer would be patience and that he had no idea. Maybe it was because of whatever bait called them but they were all rabid and just tried to get a bite of him more than anything else. Looking at the device in his hands as he sat against a tree, Itaka wondered if this was really the life he wanted to live in his death. Of course, being a Shinigami felt way different than being a ninja but the thing was that he was still repeating what he did back in the elemental nations. Right now, he was a member of the second division in all but name and Yuriuaki was named as his charge and at the end of it all, here he was at another impossible mission. Truly, change is hard. There was something ironic in those words considering that they came from an illusion master. Chapter 42, The Mission 4 12th Division Research Institute Kisuk was staring at a huge monitor in the main room of the Research Institute along with the other Shinigami present, all keeping notice of the numerous red dots on the screen that depicted the location of the groups of Shinigami sent out and at the edge of the screen was a bright blue dot and that was what had Kisuk's attention. The device given to attack it was an automatic energy scanner that would send in the energy reading of wherever it was real time without needing to be activated. So far, the marker has been going forward without any hiccups or weird reading from the reports it sent in, but something still unnerved Kisuk about everything. He tried contacting Yuriuaki but she was currently busy and he couldn't reach her, well he could if he used a hell butterfly but he chose not to. Tsukame can you please pull up the reading of Itaka's location four hours prior before he left? He asked one of the assistants who quickly pulled it up on a small section of the huge monitor. He has been a tad bit paranoid when Itaki and Yuriuaki pointed out the possibility that a Shinigami might be working with the Hollows. He could understand why the captain commander didn't want to entertain such a thought as it would mean even his captains were under suspicion and would cause conflict between the Shinigami body of the Godi I-13. It was a recipe for chaos and discord. Kisuk understood why even agreeing with such a notion was threatening, but he was also a logical man and the calculations were more in favor of a Shinigami behind the disappearing souls. In other words, for someone to coordinate hollow attacks from the Siridei, it would mean that they have access to a Shinigami's location when in the field, and for them to do that they would have to have access to this room and its files and know how to manipulate the system so that they won't be found if they tampered with anything. With Kisuk's memory and his recent bout of paranoia, he had spent days going over every piece of information they had concerning the recent disappearances and the more he did the more he felt something was amiss. Looking at the report on the screen, Kisuk's eyes schemed over every single thing, down to the dots and spaces. Akito, the coefficient of Raishi diffusion in a stable environment is supposed to be the quarter of a minute, or am I missing something? The man called Akito looked confusedly at his pairs who looked just as confused as him so he turned to Kisuk and answered unsurely, not knowing what his captain was trying to say. Yes. Right? Now someone compute that but with a four-hour difference and compare it to the reading we have now. Kisuk ordered. Yes Captain. It only took a few seconds before another part of the screen was shaved off for the new report. 
Kisuk scrutinized the two reports for any difference and other than some decimal numbers being different, nothing else looked amiss. He was about to wave off this paranoia when something clicked in his head. If the calculations were right the first time around and the same variables were used for the second one, basic mathematics says that both answers should be the same. And when it comes to miscalculation in energy imbalances, Kisuk's head whipped to Akito who stood shocked, not knowing why his captain was looking at him with a fierce expression. Sir. Send out an urgent notice, now. All Shinigami out on mission in the Rukonga are to return immediately, head captain's orders. The group of scientists looked at Kisuk in horror as he issued an order with the head captain's name when none was given. Why are you still looking at me, get on it. I'll talk to the head captain. He stormed out of the room and utilizing Shunpo, he headed straight for the head captain's office. If the calculations were wrong in the energy reading, even by a small unit, the scanners the Shinigami carried would send back false readings as it was calibrated with the reading of the research institute which might have turned out to be out. But how could our energy readers be incorrect? It's been in use since Captain Hikifun was head of the division. This was worse than he expected. The people aiding the Hollows were inside the research institute which would give them foremost knowledge about Shinigami outside the Siridei. Hopefully it's all a false alarm and I missed something. He hoped. POV, with Itaki. No matter how long Itaka searched for where the Hollows came from, he came up with the only conclusion he could come to in respect of his findings, or lack thereof, was that they came through the Garganta the spatial bridge Hollows used to travel the three worlds. Can Hollow Bait attract Hollows all the way from Hueco Mundo? He asked himself as he trudged back slowly, very slowly, as his body wasn't in the best of shapes. Broken bones and bruised skin were the highlight of his day. Where should I go now? He wondered. If it turned out that the Siridei or Yuriuaki and some of the other captains were behind this, then it meant that him going back was just him begging to be locked up and executed. But if it's someone else? He was thinking hard on it and the other thing that came with it was him questioning himself if the Siridei was that important to him that he wanted to go back. The answer to that would be no. He didn't want to be an aimless wanderer in the soul society, that wasn't a way to live. Humans were social creatures and despite his hard countenance and off-putting behavior, Itaka cherished bonds more than anyone else, just like every Uchiha. H, Lo. C, and you hear me. Itaki Uchiha, please come in. This is Captain Urahara speaking, please respond if you copy. Itaka looked at the communicator and wondered whether to pick it up or not. He could use this chance to make himself M.I. A and go underground for a while before assuming another identity and find a life in the Rukonga. Maybe even find a way back to the world of the living and check on what has happened to it. His choices were few and were ones that he could commit his life to without regretting or giving up halfway, but somehow it felt dull. Lackluster and vapid. He silently cursed himself as he pulled the device to his ear and responded. Itaki Uchiha, speaking. Thank goodness you're still alive or else I'm afraid your Yuaki would have demanded my head. Kisuk joked with what seemed like relief, though Itaki couldn't be sure. The captain commander issued an order for all Shinigami to return to the Siridei post haste. Why? Kisuk sighed wearily, something Itaka could picture given how the captain regularly looked. It looks like your assumption was right, Itaki, at least that's how it's currently looking. I see. Saying that he ended the call before Kisuk did but didn't make an effort to move, until an hour later when he finally pushed himself off the ground. Going back to the Siridei was without any of the fanfare Itaki expected. No poisons, sprung up traps, his best friend trying to assassinate him, except this one was impossible. His summary of this mission Yuriuaki has thrown at him was that it served no purpose. There was no hollow trail to follow, no feeding ground he found, or any clue as to the weird behavior of the hollows. He just went out, fought a bunch of hollows, almost died while doing so, got severely injured, and now he was going back with nothing to show. Crossing the west gates, he slowed down on his journey in getting to Yuriuaki's office and when he arrived, the door was swung open by Swa Fon who was taken aback with how battered he looked before she ushered him in. What the hell happened? Yuriuaki asked, a little concerned as she saw the bruises and parts of his body that were fractured. Itaka looked at Yuriuaki, really looked at the purple-haired and golden-eyes woman who was waiting for him to speak, and ultimately ended up sighing. A stampede of hollows, both Jillian's and Ajicha's Minos. He said. What? The two women exclaimed in shock as that was something would have killed even a competent lieutenant, and more worrying when they didn't hear any news about such a thing. 
He briefly narrated what happened to Yuriuki and gave her the device he was given for the mission before leaving for the 4th Division as instructed by Yuriuki. Even he knew he needed some rest after what he just did. Thankfully the 4th Division was a place quiet enough to take a nap during his treatment. Chapter 43, Monsters The 4th Division of the Godi I-13 was strictly healing and the only non-combatant squad in the Siridi I effectively the Shinigami Hospital Ward. And as Ataka quickly noticed as he walked through their gate, they were also the most calm and peaceful of the 13 divisions. He had barely made it past their doors when someone rushed to his attendants and inquired why he was here, visit or healing the standard reasons. Well then, follow me. They led him to a room and told him to lie down. Someone will be here in a few seconds to attend to you. He made himself comfortable on the bed, wondering when last he had ever been on a hospital bed never was the answer. The curtain covering his bed slid open and a female nurse walked in holding a clipboard. Itaki Uchiha, 2nd Division. I'll examine you now. She read out from the clipboard and waited for Itaka to nod before she proceeded. Most of his smaller wounds were already halfway healed and though he realigned his broken bones, those and the deep gashes were yet to heal. A green glow covered the nurse's hands as she drew it above his body, calm and focused as she took note of all his injuries and their nature. Quite a fight you had there. Hollows. She made light conversation to draw away Ataka's attention from the healing process and the pain the injuries were causing him, an admirable consideration, and Ataka could appreciate her efforts even if he did not need them. Even their healing art surpasses that of medical ninjas on a fundamental level. He noted. This was just another instance added to the increasing pile of proof of how Ryatsu was superior to Chakra. When his healer turned away from his face, he opened his Sharingan and stared intently on the green glow that was over the side of his abdomen and how every tissue and flesh was being connected to their respective end. Of course. He told himself and closed his Sharingan before resting his head against the pillow. Just like Irene Ninjutsu, medical ninjutsu, his eyes couldn't copy the Kaid technique the healer was utilizing. Unlike ninjutsu and had slash Bakud, Irene Ninjutsu and Kaid were more raw energy manipulation and theoretical knowledge than the former that was energy utilization. While the Sharingan's ocular prowess was advanced, it also had its limitations even when it came to things it could do. Things like Keki I Genkai Ninjutsu and techniques with raw energy manipulation, i.e. Teijutsu, healing techniques, summonings and a lot more. Hours passed and Ataka just laid silently on the bed with his eyes closed as if asleep, watching everything the healer did but never once letting it slip that he was awake, even when she took breaks. After six slow hours of healing, all his major injuries were more or less taken care of, which was more than enough for him to function at top efficiency but he still laid on the bed and rested with his eyes closed. Suffering from a terminal illness at a very young age made him appreciate the effort healers put in healing their patients. So even if he could move now, he waited for when he was told he could go. Everyone to your station, Captain Anohana is supervising the patients. He heard someone say and at those words, he could feel people shifting around his ward going to their patients and making sure they had been properly attended to before moving to another one. It was a normal thing for Captain Anohana and her lieutenant to do supervisions from time to time, teaching and correcting the young healers of her division. And due to the casualties, especially after the last division-wide mission, she has been attending to the unending influx of wounded Shinigami and thought to do a check after getting some free time for herself. She gave advice to those who needed it and answered all the questions she was asked as she moved through the numerous wards. Thankfully she had her lieutenant and leaders of the ten relief teams, her divisions equivalent of the seated officers of the other divisions, else she wouldn't have been able to thoroughly inspect her healers in time. She entered another ward with rows of beds with all their curtains opened for her to inspect the patients. During her checks, she came across a rather memorable face from one of the previous captains meeting a few months ago the man Yuriuki took in, Itaki Uchiha. It wasn't every day one sees a recently reincarnated soul that strong and the impression he left on the captains was commendable. Oh and he wasn't sleeping, so she wasn't disturbing him. Glad to see you in good health, Mr. Uchiha. I see your recent mission wasn't without its hiccups. Itaka slowly opened his eyes and nodded at her in greeting. I'm rather fine, Captain Anohana. Then I'm glad. She smiled softly. Hope to see you again, or I guess not. Have a good rest, Mr. Uchiha. She nodded at him and continued her checks while Itaka closed his eyes and went back to resting. His healer came to him a few minutes after and told him he wouldn't be discharged for a few days for a complete healing. Itaka had wanted to leave upon hearing that as the remaining wounds and pains he was feeling weren't something that'll affect his daily activities but he stopped himself, rather forcefully even, 
by reminding himself that there was no reason he had for wanting to rush back to the second. So the next three days was him taking his time to relax and bring his running thoughts to a stop. He also met Captain Anohana twice after her first check and the woman was always patient and calm whenever she was spoken to. They had a brief conversation on both occasions before she continued with her duty and Ataka had to say that Captain Anohana, out of all the captains, was the one he had the most favorable impression of. After the last mission that was forcefully stopped by Captain Kisuk upon finding out that their data registry had been tampered with, the Onmitsukid were ordered by the head captain to find out who was responsible for what was an act of treason. Kisuk was temporarily suspended as Yoruaki had him under investigation, a formality on her end, while her subordinates coomed through the entire 12th division and by the end of the week, was successful in rooting out the person responsible. The man responsible, Kinyaro Tamori, was a close assistant of the 12th Division former captain, Kirio Hikifun, and greedy for the same success of his predecessor, started experimenting on Hollows and Shinigami in fact, any soul he could get his hands on. As his strength was rather subpar, he started experimenting on Hollows in hope of cultivating their powers for himself. Surprisingly, he was able to kickstart his sick goals in the short span of time where the division was without a captain after the former captain had retired. Yamamoto had called for his execution after he was tortured by the Onmitsukid of everything he knew and all the plans he had made and the execution was carried out by the current captain of the 12th Division, Kisuk Urahara, in front of the other captains, their lieutenants and a few other Shinigami of the Godi I-13. Watching the execution, Itaka was witness to the spectacle of all the captains releasing their riotsu in a show of intimidation for any would-be traitor wanting to follow in Kinyaro Tamora's steps, and it was then he truly realized what type of people were the captains. What he felt from them at that moment was not a sensation he'd ever felt from any ninja, cage, or sunin. Instead, it was reminiscent to what he had felt from the tailed beasts. Excluding the overwhelming malevolence of the tailed beasts, the captains matched them in intensity, but that wasn't what had truly terrified Itaki of the nature of the Shinigami captains. No, what rooted him to his spot with sweat running down his brows, were the few captains whose intensity surpassed even that of the nine-tailed beast. Most people would not have felt it because of how addled and chaotic the atmosphere became, but Ataka could literally see the spiritual pressures, Ryurioku, of the captains, despite them still controlling it and preventing it from smoldering the other Shinigami present to death. Head Captain Genri Yusai Yamamoto Shigakuni 4th Division Captain Retsu Anohana 8th Division Captain Shunsui Kiraku 10th Division Captain Ishin Shiba 11th Division Captain Kenpei Kizaraki 12th Division Captain Kisuk Urahara. These six captains had the most powerful intensity from the others, though Itaka noticed the weird spiritual pressure of the 13th Division Captain, Jaishir Yukatake, and from those six, three of them in particular were above anything he had seen. The head captain, Zaraki Kenpeki, and Kisuk Urahara, the three of them instantly redefined what the term monsters meant to Itaki. Just for that instant, the veil surrounding the Shinigami was lifted for Itaka's eyes. Chapter 44 The New Routine a few months later. It has been months after the semi-public execution of Kinyaro Tamori on the grounds of treason against the Soul Society as a whole and after his execution, the unexplained disappearances stopped and hollow sightings reduced drastically to what was considered natural. During this time, Itaka tried his best to live as true as much as he could amidst the nightmares and screams that came to his mind any time he fell asleep. It wasn't easy well it hasn't been easy for him for years because every night he was subjected to the same dream but different faces and screams. Since the night of the massacre, it felt as if he was trapped in a Tsukuyomi of his own making. No, not Tsukuyomi, instead the infinite loop of the Izanami. It became even worse for him after the execution because the dreams became frequent and sometimes hard to wake up from. A trauma he hadn't gotten over even after a decade. Even after so many internal debates and advice from Tsukuyomi, Itaki repeatedly found himself coming back to this particular sensation of feeling lost and wondering what to do. The night after the execution was one he had spent completely awake by staring at the night sky to pass the hours. Witnessing the execution made him question if being in the Siridei was a wise choice. He might have placated himself saying that the Shinigami of Siridei fought against hollows but the execution was like a mockery of intentional naivete. This was even worse than his Akatsuki days because then he had a directive. A few days after the execution, Itaka decided to stroll through the nearby Rukonga districts just to distance himself from the Siridei and think clearly without him trying to assign himself a Shinigami's duty. One of the good things after the execution was that Yoruaki stopped snooping around his movements and even took back the group of people she had watching him. His stroll into the West Rukonga's district ended up turning into something he never expected. Flashback, 
West Rukonga, a few days after the execution. He might have been lost in his head so much that he didn't know when he crossed into the third district but that didn't stop him either. He only noted his location and continued walking around idly. Unfortunately, he was brought out of his mental therapy by the rhythmic sound of two things smacking against each other along with the soft panting from exhaustion. Following the sound, Itaka came across a young man, mid-twenties from his looks, or maybe his mid-hundreds, smacking a wooden stick fashioned like a sword against a tree while looking completely exhausted. He gave the boy two minutes before he fainted from exhaustion if he continued striking his sword only to be proven wrong when the boy barely made it to the first minute before be keeled over. With how close this district was to the Siridei, so close that its tall white walls were completely visible from where he stood, he didn't have to worry about the young man's safety but despite that he ended up sitting on a tree for the next few minutes to see if the young man would wake up but he didn't. Muttering under his breath, he stood up from where he was sitting and walked away while keeping a certain distance from the fainted soul. He ended up catching an animal by the type he returned to check if the boy was gone, but no he was still there. He made quick work with butchering and skinning the meat, silently thankful that he came with his satchel for his knives which had a little bit of salt from his Rukonga days. No sooner had he started salting the roasting meat did the young man start stirring up from his hour-long sleep. He watched as the man tried pulling himself up with the little bit of strength he got from his sleep but he just fell down breathing heavily while his eyes moved around to take note of his surroundings. Stay still. Itaka said and watched the young man freeze before his eyes widened as he finally took note of Itaki and what he was doing. You're still exhausted. Close your eyes and relax. A few minutes later, Itaka was done with the roasted meat and served some on leaves and gave it to the laying man. Eat slowly. I don't have water. He said. Sure the young man didn't need food as souls didn't need such sustenance but eating would make him recover his energy faster. They spent the next few minutes slowly eating in silence and when Itaka was done, he turned around to leave but the young man called out to him. Please wait. Came a frantic shout that instantly silenced as Itaka stopped. Are you a Shinigami? What of it? Itaki, now fully turned, was staring at the man who fearfully took a step back as he was rendered under Itaka's stare. M-I-N-N name is Jun P.I. I, I want to be a Shinigami. What does that have to do with me? Itaka's hard stare didn't let up and the other party frantically shook his head and hands. I tried taking the Shin Academy exam but I failed. He said while looking down. Twice. And like I said, what does that have to do with me? Itaki asked again and this time the man couldn't say anything, stuttering as his head hung low. He turned around and left. Flashback ends. Um, Mr. Shinigami, are you sure this is safe? For me. A timid Junpei held his wooden sword, one perfectly shaped after a katana, and so did Itaki. How did they get to this point? Well, after leaving Junpei alone when they first met, Itaki met him again a few weeks later, this time in another place far away from where they had initially met. Of course, Junpei had been scared and frozen up when he suddenly came across Itaki for the second time but Itaki ignored him. Since then, Almost as if Itaki was stalking him, Jun P.I. would never let him hear of those thoughts, they met a couple of times and every time Jun P.I. would try to get Itaki to help him but each time he was faced with simple questions like why? For what? And they always stomped him. Maybe because he was too persistent or because Itaki had nothing better to do, the next time they came across each other at where Jun P.I. frequented for his suicide training, the young man was surprised to see Itaki with two perfectly carved swords that he gave to Jun P.I. for storage. From that day, a month after their initial meeting, Itaki would pop up unannounced and if Jun P.I. wasn't with the swords he wouldn't train him, something the latter quickly figured out as he started coming with both swords every day, week in week out regardless of if Itaki showed up or not. Since the beginning, Itaki never told him his name, not that he didn't want to but Jun P.I. didn't ask and just settled for calling him Mr. Shinigami. Start? At Itaki's words, Jun P.I.'s face turned serious and he rushed at Itaka with a downward slash which Itaka sidestepped and hit his sword to further unbalance him. Just like he never asked Itaka for his name, Itaka never asked him why he was hell-bent on becoming a Shinigami. Parrying, sidestep, dodge, counter-attack were the few things Itaka focused on. He knew that the requirements for entry into the Shin Academy was strictly Ryatsu-based so he made Jun P.I.'s training into a montage to kickstart his subpar Ryatsu. From pushing his own Ryatsu into Jun P.I.'s body after every training session to stimulate the latter's Ryatsu, he also made sure that throughout the duration of every training session, Jun P.I.'s mind must be focused on trying to flow his Ryatsu into the wooden sword. Because of how advanced and complex manipulating Ryatsu was, 
he made Jun Pi do it just like how ninjas did with Chukra the same way he pushed his own Ryatsuo into the young man's body. As if something was showing him off, Jun Pi finally picked up how to flow his Ryatsuo after almost two months of trials and errors. Though Ataka didn't comment on just how poor the oblivious youth was doing it. With the recent breakthrough, Jun Pi started flowing his Ryatsuo into his sword and using it to attack Ataki, redoing it every time his concentration was broken. The dynamic between the two of them was hilarious and bad at the same time with Jun Pi rarely ever asking Ataki any serious questions, even about the ones with his Ryatsuo exercise, and Ataki hardly speaking a word except to directly tell Jun Pi to do something specific. A small updraft of air picked up around them as Jun Pi blindly waved a sword with his leaking Ryatsuo at Ataka who took his time to break Jun Pi's concentration every time the youth was getting comfortable. After all, the reason behind every single exercise they did was to exert and exhaust Jun Pi's Ryatsuo in order to stimulate any kind of minor growth. It worked for Jenin and Chunin ninjas so there was a high chance it would for him too. Chapter 46, Chapter 45, Acknowledgement Jun Pi knelt on the ground, thoroughly spent gasping in a bid to get his breathing in order. Ever since Mr. Shinigami started carrying those exercises on his body, he found out that he started getting tired more easily and quickly than before but he didn't say anything and desperately hoped that Mr. Shinigami wasn't playing a sick ploy with him. He listened to what Mr. Shinigami said and did what he was told to do obediently because to him, Mr. Shinigami looked like one of those people who hated wasting time. However, his tiny suspicions and worries vanished when he found out that he actually felt stronger and brimming with energy. He might or might not have stupidly punched a tree and all he got in return was a painful screech of a scream and nothing happening to the tree. He had no way of knowing if he was truly strong or his head was messing with him, but all that became a moot point when he started getting a tiny bit faster, all up to the day where for the first time he actually was able to move his right so and feel it leave his body in tiny wisp. Covering the sword with it, he quickly found out made him exhausted in a short time but he believed Mr. Shinigami knew what he was doing. He is the Shinigami between the both of them. Get up. He heard Mr. Shinigami's dry scary voice and he pushed himself off the ground with all of his depleted strength. Again. Great. First, calm breath. Next, concentrate and gently pull it out. Now breathe again and hold it steady. Jun Pi's body croaked as he once more pushed out his last dregs of Ryatsuo and let it burn away as he pushed it to his sword. He opened up another salvo of attacks that Mr. Shinigami met head on, not sidestepping or parrying like he used to do. One thing that unnerved Jun Pi about Mr. Shinigami was that the scary soul always knew when he was out of energy and Ryatsuo and when he was lying about being completely tired. He barely lasted five minutes before he fell to the ground without even sufficient energy to groan as he hit the ground and to prove him right. Mr. Shinigami said nothing but just dropped his wooden sword, signifying the day's session was over, much to Jun Pi's relief. The entrance exam is coming up soon in a few months. Jun Pi heard him say but couldn't decide if it was a question or a statement. He tried saying something but the only thing that came out from his throat was a guttural groan. You're getting better. Jun Pi stilled as those foreign words entered his ears. By the time he got himself together and managed to turn his head towards where Mr. Shinigami stood but the man was gone. This was the first compliment, both good and bad, that have been exchanged between them. If not for how spent he was, he wanted to shout his heart out. Maybe, just maybe, I can become a Shinigami. That thought became more prevalent in his mind that it was the only thing he could think of as he walked back home. POV, with Itaki. Walking back to his abode. He returned slight nods to those who greeted him on the way. Both the members of the Unmistooked Special Forces and the 2nd Division knew him or knew of him to an extent because apparently they all expected him to have the position of a seated officer since he was more than qualified to and were even surprised when he expressed his lack of interest in squad politics. The 2nd Division were not the best people but one thing Attack is silently appreciated about them was that they mostly kept to themselves, which meant as little people as possible trying to come at odds with him. He hard barely put down his satchel when he heard a knock on his door and from the familiar feel of their Ryatsu, it was one of Yuriyuki's messengers. Stepping out of his door, the messenger quickly delivered his message and left. The summary of it was that Yuriyuki wanted him to report to her office whenever he comes back. The laid-back captain of the second was fun and games for most of the times you come across her, especially privately, but she knew how to give out seemingly unending tasks. I left six days ago. Neither too long or short. Itaka briefly pondered as he entered the building of Yuriyuki's office. He knocked on her door and entered after her permission to find her reading through reports and stamping them. And here I thought you'll be taking a full week or two off. 
Yoruyuki joked while Ataka stood Ramrod straight to the side. She had gotten used to his silence and she liked to believe Ataka knew how to take on her frivolities in stride. How the hell Swafon can be more of a prude than Ataka is something I still am yet to understand. She thought to herself. What do you want, Yoruyuki? He came off strong in a way that would have been seen as disrespecting but the purple-haired captain let it wash over her like wind. Swafon is currently unavailable and she's the one I usually have around for tasks like these. She started slowly as her hand darted over the stacks of paper while Ataka listened on in silence. Family duties. Mind accompanying me? Yes, I do. Itaki replied without missing a beat. She could go anywhere she wanted without an escort so she wasn't fooling him with such a lame attempt. Sheesh. First you refused to join the Onmistukid and now you don't even want to accompany me. You're Yuki. Itaka stressed. Fine. She sighed as she dropped her pen to look at him. Work directly for me, Itaki. Their current relationship can be said to be one of accumulating favors where they request something from the other in cost of a few favors, heavily depending on the value of the favor they were giving. You already know my answer. Itaki replied. It was a weird conversation to have given that Yoruyuki was Itaka's captain either way but to them who knew the depth and weight of the words spoken, it was layers deeper than any who heard it might think. I know. That's why I'm still asking. Yoruyuki said not surprised at Ataka's swift rejection or hit it well if she was. I understand your reasons behind why you don't want to. And yet. He stared at her and she took it in and returned it. What do you want my loyalty for, Yoruyuki? And should I point out how strange you're acting? She looked surprised at the latter bit, knowing she was acting out of wonk and made a irritated groan at the realization. I guess I've been thinking too seriously as of late. I think I'll pester Kisuk later for a spar to let out some steam. Itaka said nothing and just let her verbally release her frustration. So. Actually I want you to accompany for a meeting of clan heads, not for me but for you. I know someone you might be able to ask some questions without offending them. Why am I doing this? Obviously because you are lost, or else you wouldn't be spending days in the Rukonga. Questions. Itaka had them, no doubt, but he knew some answers were better searched for than given. Also this might give him an understanding of the noble families and how their existence affect the soul society. I'm not in a hurry. I'll think about it. Itaka said and turned to leave the office as Yoruyuki gave him her parting words. Kenpeki is looking for you so don't be surprised when you find a short pink et popping up around you. After the doors closed, Yoruyuki dropped her pen and threw her head backwards because something impossible just happened and she was too carried away to quickly notice it. Yoruyuki shy and never begs for anything least of all for someone's loyalty. How it came to that was something she had little control of. Oh. Maybe I should visit Kyokaku. Yes, ha ha ha. To hell with these reports. She said and stomped out of her office before disappearing with a shunpo as she headed towards the Shiba residence. Chapter 47, Chapter 46, Harnessing Potential Itaka secluded himself in a part of the forest surrounding the west gate and sat on top a boulder with both legs crossed with his sword resting on his legs. It only took a moment before his consciousness plunged into the dark red world of Tsukuyomi and there he was, as huge and black as he was in the beginning. Tsukuyomi. He called out, not minding the part of Tsukuyomi's feathers that fell off and turned to smoke only for the wisp of smoke to coalesce into crows that flew around him. Itaki. Tsukuyomi's head bent down halfway to look at Itaki. What do you require of me, Itaki? Like always, Tsukuyomi was already offering his help to Itaki. Not just Tsukuyomi's deference to Itaki, the both of them shared a very close relationship, so close that only the captains could boast of this bond with their Zanpakut spirit and yet still envy it. What all of them were unaware of however was that Tsukuyomi literally used to be Itaka's eyes. How could an eye deceive the body and force them all to ruin? If it was up to Tsukuyomi he would have granted Itaki access to the Manjiki and even the Eternal Manjiki if he could and it wouldn't have an adverse effect on Itaki. Amaterasu. I still can't hear them. How much longer? Itaki asked. Is my soul not strong enough yet? Unfortunately, it isn't time yet. Tsukuyomi said and ruffled his feathers, causing his feathers and crows to descend towards Itaki. Your soul is not in perfect synchrony with us. Not even with me. And how do I fix that? Itaki asked, not minding the murder of crows that were entering and exiting his clothes. The perfect synchrony is when you can use my illusions as easily as breathing. 
you're still far from that and saddling you with Amaterasu would do neither of you any good. I see. Itaka nodded in understanding but then remembered something just as crucial. Bang Kai. How does one achieve it? Tsukuyomi tilted his head at Itaki, expressing his confusion which Itaki immediately picked on. What? Your Bankai and your Manjiki Sharingan are one and the same, Itaki. Tsukuyomi clarified and that was when it hit him. His Zanpakut spirits were Tsukuyomi and Amaterasu, meaning that whatever his Bankai was would be a blend of both of their abilities and the only way for him to use the extensively would be unlock his Manjiki Sharingan, which is also their true form or the core of their souls. Thinking about it that way, it became obvious why Tsukuyomi wanted his soul to grow stronger. He was different from the other Shinigami after all. I understand now, especially why you are saying I'm not perfectly synchronized with either of you. You are not the same as you were when we were alive. No we are not. Putting us inside a Zanpakut not only strengthened our symbiotic relationship but also removed the restriction your human limitations placed on us, enabling us to express ourselves in the truest way to our name. Itaka silently nodded while he held out his arm for one of the crows to perch on, only for the both of them to fall into a staring contest. So, after getting sufficiently strong enough to handle the strain of both of your truest forms, how do I actually get Bankai? Itaki asked, slowly peeling away his eyes from the crow who then flew away as she turned to Tsukuyomi. His reasons for asking this question were very important and Tsukuyomi knew that as well. For your Bankai, you'll have to defeat me in Amaterasu's truest form at the same time. Tsukuyomi purposely saying it slowly made it sound more ominous to the hearing ear. You must be able to suppress both of our abilities at the same time and that has its own symbolic meaning. Defeating your Bankai means that your body is strong enough to handle the strain of using it without dying and that your soul is strong enough to house our grown spirit. The crows around Itaka formed a chair of smoking wisps and slowly pushed him towards Tsukuyomi. Imagine the empty Asachi blade as an incubator for Zanpakut spirits to grow and realize their potential. Shikai is just the first stage of growth, us spreading our wings for the first time. Bankai on the other hand is us fully grown and ready to return our grown core back to your soul our origin. So your soul must be strong enough to permanently house our spirit, too in this case. Tsukuyomi calmly and clearly explained the intricacies of the Shinigami's Bankai to Ataka who was finally able to paint an accurate picture of why needed to be less lacking when it came to his soul. No need to rush, Itaki. Like every other Bankai, it will make itself known when it feels that you are ready, like I do you. Today was a real eye-opener for Itaki. It was something expected but it was the scale of it that genuinely surprised Itaki. I appreciate you telling me this, Tsukuyomi. Itaki said as he wore a contemplating look on his face. Everything Tsukuyomi said was valuable but one of his major takeaways from it all was that even his Shikai was lacking much more than he thought. If he couldn't be perfectly synchronized with Tsukuyomi with his basic Shikai abilities then all it did was show him how unprepared for Bankai he was. Tsukuyomi raised his head and looked at the red moon that almost looked as if it was shining brighter. He looked at Itaka so lost in himself that he didn't register the changes in this illusory world, or maybe he did but just ignored it. This was after all the safest place he could be. Tsukuyomi turned his head to face a certain direction, closed his beady eyes and slowly faded away. As Itaka's spirit guides and more so his eyes, it was their role to pave the way to any desires his heart might birth, to turn his dreams into a realization something Tsukuyomi felt was specifically his duty. Fret not, Tsukuyomi. He'll have the chance and time to grow. I will make sure of that. A very dark sputtering voice filtered into Tsukuyomi's head as he faded away, wholly agreeing with the sentiment the voice spoke with. Pulling himself from his thoughts, Itaka looked around and found that Tsukuyomi was gone. The gigantic crow always knew the best time to be present or to leave, something Itaka never had the thought to comment on. Opening wide his palms, the crows around him started cawing loudly and a few flew towards his hands and lost their tangible form, leaving only the inky black smoke that swirled above his palms and soon started stretching to the shape of a sword. Even if it looked like it had no solid body, Itaka held it as such as it felt as such. He threw it to the ground and the shadowy blade sank over 2-3 RDS into the ground. Simple Genjutsu won't cut it at this point anymore. My illusions can grow even more. He said. Using Tsukuyomi to his fullest potential. It will take some time but I can make it work. Bankai could wait, he told himself as the red world started fading away. As a Zanpakut, Tsukuyomi's Shikai didn't have much in terms of firepower but that was okay with Itaki. With enough control and training, he reckoned he'd have a very high level grasp of his illusions and breaking out of them would be harder as well. 
Standing up, Itaka looked at the blade in his hands before strapping it to his waist. He wanted to leave but paused as his mind went to the training workaholic young man, Jun Pi, who he hadn't seen for some days now. Chapter 48, Chapter 47, A Tactical Retreat Itaka's days as a Shinigami passed slowly with the most part of it being uneventful. Without the need to eat or sleep, and no mission assigned for a long stretching period of time, Shinigami found themselves bored most of the time but it was how they utilized this boring time that created the difference between Shinigami. The Godi I-13 was lax in its rules when it came to how Shinigami lived their lives, and as long as they didn't break any set-down rules nobody cared how they spent their time away from their Shinigami duties. For Itaki, it was falling into a routine he had never done for years, training proficiency in his abilities. As a natural genius, he had mastered everything he needed to be an extremely skilled shinobi at a very young age. Since he found himself with nothing to do through the majority of his time, unless when he was either with a captain or with Yuriuaki and Swa Fon, he spent most of his time in learning ways his shikai could be further utilized. After his conversation with Tsukuyomi a while back about the true nature of his Zan Pakut, Itaka forced himself to stop thinking about his illusions as simple metal mirages. In his mindscape, he noticed that both he and Tsukuyomi could make illusions into real and tangible things. He breathed in softly and swung his sword lazily at an empty space yet his eyes was squinting in focus on a marked tree off to the side. Am I overreaching or am I truly not at that level yet? He thought with a frown. At that moment, a voice interrupted his silent pondering. If you want to cut the tree, you should swing your sword at it, don't you think? Turning to the direction of the voice, he saw a pink-haired child in standard Shinigami attire freely swinging her legs off the tree branch she sat on. How did she get here? He thought as he observed her. A lieutenant armband, I see. Anno. You were trying to cut something right? Kenny also likes to cut things too. Her voice, her mannerisms, and her exuberant emotions in a carefree display gave Itaka the opinion of her being a normal happy-go-lucky child, but one could never know when it came to souls. Lieutenant Yachiru, Itaka started slowly, gauging her reaction that remained genuinely carefree, are you by chance looking for me? He remembered a far-off warning Yuriuaki gave him about the pink ed in front of him. Oh no I'm not the one looking for you, Kenny is. He's been bored recently so I decided to look for you, ERM. Itaki. She clicked her fingers upon remembering his name. Tachi Tachi. Yes, Kenny is looking for you because none of the captains accepted to fight him so he's hunting for the lieutenants and you. I apologize but I'd have to decline. Despite everything about her telling him that she was just a child, Itaka maintained his politeness, especially when he remembered the monsters that were the captains and also his first conversation with Captain Kiraku. Aun, that's too bad she pouted in dissatisfaction which slowly merged with a difficult expression on her face. I don't think Kenny will let you go even if you say that. Just then, they heard the shout of a hoarse voice and their senses finally registered the blazing sun that was the incoming Ryatsu. Kenny, over here. She shouted in response. I made sure he didn't run away like you asked. Itaka looked at Yachiru, not knowing the appropriate reaction to her words. Is she this naive? Or is this simply the personality she lives as after living for centuries? Regardless of the nature of the eccentricities of century-old souls, Itaka promptly decided to retreat. Why he would like to fight Captain Kenpei Kazaraki, he would prefer it to be on his own terms. And besides, there's something dangerous about his wild and simple nature. Kenny, hurry up. I think he wants to run away. Now that surprised Itaki as she said that immediately after he decided to leave. Unknown to Itaki, Yachiru was so accustomed to people running away from Kenpeka that she'd basically developed a sixth sense for it. Feeling the incoming spike of Ryatsu that somehow gave Itaka the illusion of crashing waves, Itaka knew that it was time to retreat. His physical strength is immense. He noted when he finally saw Kenpeki running at him with a mad grin, his feet leaving cracks on the ground with every step he took. No technique. No Ryatsu utilization. The haphazard nature of the captain's Ryatsu gave the initial impression of an amateur to any trained eye. Apart from his captain-level Ryatsu, which was one of the greatest in the Siridei, nothing about Kenpeka showed proof of him deserving the position he held, but that just made him all the more dangerous in Itaka's eyes. Brat, we meet again. Let's fight. Kenpeka shouted with a manic grin as he drew close to Itaki, his sword already stretched backwards for a powerful swing. I'm afraid I'll have to respectfully decline. Captain Zaraki. Itaka's body began breaking apart into crows but Kenpeka could care less as his sword cleaved through Itaki. 
to his confusion and eventual annoyance, Itaka's body burst into a murder of crows as soon as Ken Paika's sword touched him. What the hell is this, Yachiru? Where did he go? Ken Paika asked the little girl that was now hanging off his shoulders. Oh no, he ran away Kenny. Why does everyone keep running away from us when Kenny just wants to fight? She sounded genuinely sad, which she was, upon seeing Ken Paika losing another prospective opponent, worse being one that could actually fight against captains according to some of the captains. Ken Paika snorted. His annoyance was slowly bleeding away as Shinigami running away from him at the mention of a fight was a common occurrence. Don't worry, Kenny, I'll find him again. Let's go and meet Boobies since he's from her division. She said, referring to Yuriyuki as she did so. Ken Paika grunted willingly going ahead with anything she said. What about the one from the 12th? Captain Shaggy? Domu, we can also check if he's free to play with Kenny. She nodded to herself at how much sense her words made, fingers pointing forward as she stood balanced on Ken Paika's shoulder without leaning on his head, onwards, Kenny. Since his training was abruptly disturbed by Lieutenant Yachiru and her berserker of a captain, Itaka didn't return to the barracks of the second in case they went and looked for him there. Knowing Yuriyuki, even as little as he did, he knew for certain that she'd happily blurred out his location without hesitation should they go to her looking for him. Unfortunately for him, apart from the barracks of the second, Captain Kirikou's courtyard and the tranquility of Captain Anohana's fourth division, he had no personal safe space to hide inside the Siridei. At the end of it, he decided to walk through the roads of the Godii 13 inconspicuously to escape the wild captain and also let his mind wander on his recent failure in trying to utilize his illusionary abilities in an unconventional way. During his walk, he saw a group of Shinigami leading a larger group of students from the Shin Academy and from the discussion the excited students were having among themselves, it seemed like a combat-related activity. He remembered Junpei and the youth's dream to join the Academy and become a Shinigami and remembering that another entrance exam was around the corner, he decided to follow them and watch what they did to pass the time. Entering unimpeded inside the vicinity of the Academy, he arrived at a training field where a bunch of students were gathered, a Zanpakut strapped to everyone's waist. Some of them had unlocked their shikai, and based on the way they were grouped, whatever activity they were about to do wasn't based solely on their zanpakut. From the uniforms of their instructors, Itaki identified members of the 2nd Division, 4th Division, 12th Division, and even the reclusive Kid Corp, a division that was solely focused on the mastery of the kid arts. They were also responsible for the defenses of the Siridei and also the creation of the system that monitored the Rukonga, along with all the tools a Shinigami might need in a mission though that was now under the jurisdiction of the 12th Division. It's a sorting format if you're wondering. Activities like these help sort the students into areas they have a talent for. Itaka took only a short glance at the brown-haired man in glasses that was watching the sorting exercise with him and went back to looking at what brought him here. Oh excuse me. I'm Sukaisen, lieutenant of the 5th Division. The soft-spoken man introduced himself with a polite nod to Itaka who returned it and was about to reply in kind but Aizen beat him to it. Itaki Uchiha, I presume. Seeing the unasked question Itaka's eyes directed at him, he chuckled and scratched the back of his head embarrassingly. All the lieutenants know you defeated Lieutenant Lisa Yudmeru of the 8th Division on the same day you arrived in Siridei, so of course we lieutenants were curious. Chapter 49, Chapter 48, Nature of a Man Is it true that you fought Captain Shiba and Captain Yuriyuki, and even managed to escape from them? Aizen quickly slammed a hand over his mouth and just stared down at the students below them from the roof they sat on in awkward silence. I'm sorry if I appear too intrusive. It's just that my captain, Captain Hiroko, made a statement that only three of the thirteen lieutenants in the Godi I-13 had a chance in defeating you. I guess you can imagine how some of us lieutenants felt insulted. Aizen appeared to be a socially awkward person with how he fumbled with every sentence he spoke. Like he said, Itaka could imagine to some extent how someone who took decades and even centuries to get to the position of the vice-captain of their division, only for their captain to tell them that a newcomer, who was practically a newborn soul and wasn't even inducted in the traditional Shinigami way, was stronger than the majority of them. Practically nullifying the essence of the struggle they went through to get to their current status. If it were another place and time then it wouldn't have meant much, but, unfortunately the Godi I-13 was an extremely militaristic society which meant that strength and competency were the golden standard with which every Shinigami is judged. The fact that one could simply challenge a higher rank seated officer to a deathmatch for their position said everything that needed to be said. And it wasn't only applicable to the lieutenants and lower ranked members but even to the captains too. Case in point, Ken Peikazaraki, 
who was the current captain of the 11th Division, got his position by killing the former captain of the 11th Division in a formal death match. Itaki understood, but he didn't care about anyone's bruised ego in the slightest, not because he was arrogant of his impressive strength, but because he had no attachment to the traditions of Shinigami. The fact that he didn't accept Yuriyuki's offer of a seated officer and remained an unranked Shinigami spoke loudly. She even wanted to make him her lieutenant a while ago but he still refused. That was also when he realized that Swafon wasn't actually the lieutenant of the 2nd Division but instead was Yuriyuki's bodyguard and a member of the executive militia, who were basically the Shinigami police and disciplinary body. Seeing Itaka not saying anything, Aizen spoke up to clarify any misunderstanding Itaka might be having. I'm not saying I have a grudge against you or anything of that immature topic, I'm just genuinely curious is all. His voice went down a bar, with a hint of self-mockery mixed in. Even as a lieutenant, my strength is barely above that of the average Shinigami. Having a degree of animosity towards you for being stronger than me will be the extreme height of foolishness and hypocrisy for me. The nature of every living being, and life in general, is that no one is equal to another. Some are talented, some are not. Some push forward with hard work, while others remain content with stagnation. Talent trumps hard work and vice versa, true, but nothing trumps talent with hard work. Aizen looked at Itaka with a stunned look on his face from the words the introvert Shinobi turned Shinigami said, before his face melted in a wry and extremely pained stiff smile. I don't know whether those words were meant to serve as comfort or ridicule to me. Neither. It's the truth, or at least what I believe to be one. How you feel towards it should tell you the truth about yourself. Itaki replied and refrained from speaking further. The both of them sat in silence and watched the academy students being tested on all the facets of a Shinigami. I think it's about time I take my leave. My captain will send word for me if I spend more time here. Aizen stood up and dusted his uniform, getting ready to leave but not before addressing Itaki one last time. I genuinely enjoyed our talk, however short it might have been. Hope we meet more often. Itaki. Itaki looked at him before slowly nodding. Likewise. Aizen smiled before disappearing with his application of Shunpo. Itaki went back to watching the students as they failed and succeeded, a part of his mind thinking of his own issues with his application of Tsukuyomi ever since the moment he arrived, and through his short conversation with Aizen. Seeing the students try out various things while physically and spiritually exhausting themselves, Itaka mentally shook his head as he knew that for Shinigami the most important factor for growth was mentally as opposed to spiritually, the measure of their Ryuryoku, or even more useless physically. When he was alive, to become competent in a jutsu, he had to cast it over and over again in different scenarios until it became akin to muscle memory. For souls however, fundamentally understanding what you wanted to do automatically took care of half of the process. Achieving his Shikai actually made him realize this point as he could apply it in new ways he'd never tried before like he did against Yoruyuki and Lt. Yudmeru. He reckons the same was true for the captains and their Bankai. He doubted they practiced extensively with it to gain whatever level of mastery they had with it. How else could one grow with their Zanpakut without trying to understand their Zanpakut's spirit as deeply as they could? More so when it was a core part of their soul? Seeing some students cheer as they passed the exercise while others looked glum and sorrowful as they failed, Itaka decided that he had spent enough time idly sitting by and stood up to leave. How can you grow strong without even understanding the potential and limit ceiling of your own soul? He silently asked himself as his form slowly disappeared. Fun fact, despite following directly behind this class along with him and Aizen having a conversation while they watched them quite openly from a roof, not one of the students or the instructors were aware of their presence from start to end. Regardless of Aizen's self-loathing and lamenting his weakness, no one sensed the barest hint of his presence even when he stood up quite openly when he left. After Aizen left Itaka to return to his division, his mind broke down the little conversation he had with Itaka into fine dust particles. He was more interested in the words Itaka spoke. Every single word he spoke. A simple psychological approach where he shared his weakness with the man and listened to how Itaka responded to gauge the kind of personality he had. What was the phrase again? Nearly all men can stand adversity, but if you want to test a man's character, give him power. Aizen mused as he sat on the chair in his office and started going through the piled up stacks of documents with a bored expression on his face. Such simple words and yet they uphold a great truth. Power came in different forms and the figurative power he gave to Itaki was the superior position he made the man assume. By convincing Itaki in a few words, without doubt or reason, that he was vastly stronger than he was, he immediately got Itaka to respond in just a few seconds, and the reply he got was a bit interesting. 
he chuckled, amused at the result of the little experience he just had. Where most would console, and vainly try to convince you with empty motivations of the truth you've accepted as being false, and that the weakness you carry is a matter of circumstances and not your doing. Eisen paused, an inexplicable smile flashing through his lips for an instant, his glasses gleaming in a serial light. Talent and hard work, is it? I applaud your belief that talent with hard work trumps talent or hard work, but where you're wrong is thinking nothing trumps talent and hard work. He continued his monologues as if he was in a philosophical debate with someone else. Yes, the very nature of life is unfair, but nature's partiality is the same thing that grants our talent, and if it can give us such talents then of course it can erect an unbreakable ceiling the limit potential of every living being. Even if one has a higher level of potential than another, the highest limit ceiling is still a limit ceiling for all. He picked up a certain file from the Shin Academy and smiled as he wrote something on it and gave it his stamp of approval. If nature sets the potential for every talent and the limit for the greatest act of hard work, how can we then say talent and hard work trumps all? And if they don't, then what does? A gentle smile made a way into his face, making his nerdy face appear genuinely caring and innocent. A divine move. He said. The acts of a truly divine being cannot be restricted, and if it is, then that being was never truly divine in nature. After all, God dictates all. A common truth among Shinigami is that your Zanpakut is a reflection of your soul. The true essence and core of your spiritual being. If this was a universal truth as Shinigami believed it to be, then what did that say about certain Shinigami and their Zanpakut spirits? What did that say about people like Yamamoto, Kenpeki, and Kiso Kirahara? What does it then mean when it concerns people like Aizen and Ataki? and the true nature of their Zanpakut spirit. Chapter 50, Chapter 49, Day of Admission Under the night sky, in the middle of the forest sat a small flickering flame that crackled as it ate away at the wooden fuel thrown at it from time to time, and behind it sat two men, Itaki and Junpi. After the last time Itaki visited the youth, almost two weeks had passed before Junpi saw him again. To his credit, Jun Pi was sensible to understand that Ataka couldn't always come and teach him when he probably had other Shinigami duties to attend to. Since Ataka didn't dive into teaching him how to fight with a sword, all Jun Pi's activities with the wooden sword was for the purpose of stimulating his riot sword to grow to an acceptable level for his admission, as they would teach him the basics and fundamentals of Zankensuki, which was the four fundamental combat style of a Shinigami. The four parts Zankensuki is divided into R. Zanjutsu, which translated to swordsmanship. Ho, which is the high-speed movement-related arts where Shunpo and few others fall under. Kid, the use of a wide range of destructive and supplementary spells. Hakuta, which is the application of Shinigami hand-to-hand -hand combat style. Something that was an important requisite when joining either the second division or the Onmitsukid. He didn't teach him anything that didn't directly relate to stirring his less-than-passable Ryatsu, apart from how to properly swing a sword. The admission exams are in three days, Mr. Shinigami. Jun Pi opened up conversation, or at least he attempted to, but Ataka's response was absent-mindedly nodding his head. He was already used to Ataka's terribly recluse and quiet character so Ataka's unenthusiastic reply just washed over him harmlessly. I hope I get in. He murmured before suddenly starting laughing without anything else said. Ha ha ha, I just thought of how you'll probably kill me if I still fail to get in after your help. Unlike what he expected of his joke to be ignored. Itaki replied him with his eyes focused on the small burning flame that he was feeding with small pieces of wood. If you end up failing then that's either your limit or you didn't try hard enough. As for not trying hard enough, there's still more exams to come so you still have ample time to prepare. Whatever Junpi had been about to say before Itaki started speaking immediately died down to silence as he listened with rapt attention to whatever the ever-serious Mr. Shinigami had to say about him. It feels weird to plan for failure. He didn't know how to feel when Itaka's words felt like they were basically comforting him in advance in the likely event of him failing. Itaki raised his head to look at Junpi who shifted slightly under his black-eyed gaze. You don't plan for failure but instead accept it as a highly probable possibility with every choice you make. Damn, that sounds hardcore. Junpi remarked almost patronizingly. Anyone ever tell you that you make a great voice of reason, Mr. Shinigami? Itaka hands stopped mid-motion in feeding the excited flame more wood. It was the first time Jun Pi saw the resemblance of the closest thing to a forlorn look he'd ever seen on Ataka's face. Yeah, someone did. A deceptively long time ago. The face of the only person he ever saw as a brother, that wasn't Suzuki, appeared in his mind. 
It wasn't a secret to anyone that knew both of them that Ataka saw his best friend as his own older brother. A voice of reason. He was always the better voice of reason between the both of us. Um. I'm sorry. Itaki raised a brow at Junpei, wondering what prompted the sudden apology. You looked like you were remembering something unpleasant. Like a bad nightmare or something. Horror. What? You can wake up from a nightmare and even forget it with enough time. Mine is no simple thing like a nightmare. True horror that sticks to you like a soul stain, even after death. Picking up the last bits of broken wood, he threw them all into the flame and watched transfixed as its intensity rose up. The two of them watched as the flame burnt away all the dried wood and started burning itself out until it was nothing more than a red glow of heat amidst ashes. Go home, Junpei, and get enough rest. They both stood up at the same time knowing it was time to leave. Don't tax your body for the next two days except for your basic exercises. Hear you loud and clear. Junpei said as he watched Ataka leave, knowing there was something different about his current state than how he usually was every other day. Hey, Mr. Shinigami. He called out to the man moments before he faded away from his vision. Think I got it this time. The gratitude he felt towards Ataka was why he valued whatever Ataka had to say. For Ataka teaching him for months just because he begged persistently and earnestly guiding him whenever he was around despite not knowing anything about him other than his name. Ataka didn't even know where he lived. The answer to that is whether or not you gain admission this time around. He smiled wryly at Ataka's answer but still didn't want to give up. Then what's your name? If I become a Shinigami then everyone will become a Mr. and Ms. Shinigami. That finally got Ataka to pause his leave but not for the reasons Junpei thought. In stark opposition to Junpei's thoughts, Itaka simply stopped after realizing once more that he never actually gave the youth his name. I'll tell you either when you gain admission or when you graduate. This might be the last time we'll ever see each other, that's if you fail. The words had barely made their way into Junpei's ears when the young man realized that Itaka was gone. Grumbling to himself as he did so. The least he could say was a goodbye or see you later. He grumbled all the way in his return journey through the woods to return home but apart from his petty grievance at Mr. Shinigami for leaving him hanging, his stomach bubbled with excitement as he impatiently waited for the three days to go by. POV, with Itaki. Itaki and Swa Fon followed behind Yoruaki as she led them in the direction of the Shine clan, one of the five great noble families. She could have simply ordered a procession in a palanquin instead of going there on foot but she digressed. She'd long grown out of the stuffy noble etiquette and only showed it when absolutely necessary which was only when she was in a meeting with the other family heads. And besides, who could argue that this wasn't faster, better and overall efficient than having her sitting in a stuffy tent carried by a bunch of slow muscular guys through the sizable distance that takes an hour or two on foot. Make sure to stay by my side at all times when we get there. Swa Fon said, somewhat surprised when Ataka didn't ask any of his usual questions and just silently accepted everything with a nod. Of course Itaka would know what to do given that he was also at some point the heir to one of the oldest clans in history. Until he destroyed it with his own hands, that is. Yoruaki took a subtle glance behind her, a bit surprised too that his curious, and paranoid, nature didn't make a show of twenty questions. We're almost there. Don't worry as you'll be staying in my sight at all times. She said it more for Itaka's benefit than Swa Fon as her bodyguard was used to settings like these practically since she learned how to walk. That reminds me, today is the admission exam into the Shin Academy. Marino Shin better remember to file a report on all the new and promising admission. She said to herself, fully aware of how easily the second division lieutenant forgot himself to his slothful vice. Are there any special tests during the admission? Itaki asked all of a sudden. I don't think so. Swa Fon said, shaking her head. The bar for admission is quite median and the only thing one really has to worry about is the measuring of their riot soul levels. And in my personal opinion, the accepted level is too low that any barely competent person can pass. Yoruaki spoke up after Swa Fon, showing that she was listening to their conversation, cause by not. Though it's rare, some people's riot so only start growing when they are in a highly rich Raishi environment and the bar was intentionally set just barely above average in a bid to admit those with late growth or a hidden talent. Of course, the disadvantage of that is the multitude of severely weak souls who call themselves Shinigami despite not even being able to achieve Shikai. Any reason why you are suddenly interested in the admission exams? She asked but Ataka merely shook his head. A passing curiosity. He said as they drew closer to the white expanse of land that was the Shine clan, located at one of the far end corners of the Siridei. 
The first thing Itaki instantly noticed was that the security here was higher than anywhere else in all the barracks of the Godi I-13. Thanks for listening. <laughs>